Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, March 26, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Managing Director of TalkPoverty.com, Pat Garofalo, on the billionaire boondoggle. How our politicians let corporations and bigwigs steal our money and our jobs. Also on the program today, Trump administration seeking again to repeal the ACA, this time through the courts. Meanwhile, House and Senate Dems demand full Mueller report. McConnell blocks in the Senate. And the House will try to override Trump's veto on the emergency wall powers bill. Republicans will stop them there. 1.3 1.3 million Puerto Rican residents will have their food st- stamps cut this month, amongst other austerity measures. Pentagon hiding Google's work on drones. Stephen Moore set to destroy our economy. Bank drops a money laundering suit against Felix Sater. And Obama on the case tells freshman Dems Green New Deal too expensive. Sorry, world. Thanks, Obama. All this and more on today's uh, program. Uh, Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is uh, Tuesday. Uh, Michael is at a a dentist appointment. Everyone else is here. Just a reminder, you can support this show by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Pennies a day. You can support this program. We give you extra content uh, every day. Uh, Stephen Moore. I want to get into this. Uh, And and I will mention that that Felix Sater thing. uh, Just because I think people know that's my my pet. uh, My pet uh, uh, theory about um, that Felix Sater plays a big role, largely in part just because two and uh, some odd years ago, Wayne Barrett just kept telling me over and over again, it's all Felix Sater. Um, and uh, with the Mueller report having uh, dropped, maybe we will see it. I suspect we will see at least parts of it. Don't know how much. Um, he sounds like a white-collar criminal. Felix Sater? Oh, yeah. Well, he's... I mean, what we do know about Felix Sater is uh, seems to be some type of FBI CIA asset uh, to the extent that uh, Loretta Lynch, former uh, attorney general, but when she was back at the Eastern District of uh, of the U.S. Attorney's Office, wrote an affidavit on his behalf after he stabbed a guy in the face with a broken glass. Damn. Which is a weird thing for someone to do. But um, uh, apparently he's been an asset to uh, the FBI. Uh, Supposedly, there's reporting that he was the guy who got um, the CIA bin Laden's phone number, which is in the way that they tracked him. And there's this uh, lawsuit that uh, basically claims he ran off with the a another uh, I guess it was a mayor's family in Kazakh. Uh, with uh, 400 some odd million dollars 
that he was going to launder. This is what the lawsuit alleges. He was going to launder through the Trump Tower in uh, Moscow, as well as uh, other places around the world, and also coming back to uh, Trump Soho uh, Tower. And um, so this guy was a money launderer and a special advisor to Donald Trump. And um, he sounds like the antagonist I mean, from a Bond movie. Yeah, to exactly. To be perfectly honest, without even knowing any of that stuff you just said. Well, he's. A, I think he was a he was a stoolie. He was an asset, and um, and he was probably run out of the New York FBI office. So, um, I don't know. You start to get uh, like you know you uh, obviously. I mean, nothing I've said is is, is is speculative. It's all been reported. There is a lawsuit. There is um, an affidavit that um, Loretta Lynch uh, put in there. What the meaning of it is, I don't know. But um, Intrigue. Uh, there is some intrigue here. And um, it suggests, um, you know, the in terms of the, um, the genesis of the investigation that Mueller ultimately took over from Comey after Comey was fired by the president. The president said, I fired him because he was investigating me. I mean, that's, you know, I, I, th there's no doubt that... We can see our way to look past this. Right. I mean, look, there's no doubt that um, there were people who used this uh, investigation for their own purposes, ranging from, um, you know, people who want to be on TV uh, quite a bit and... Um, uh, to uh, people who thought that maybe it would help them electorally. We know the Democrats didn't run on that uh, particularly, but you know, I, I, on some level, it's in the uh, background. I think it was used at times that it, it uh, you know, when it looked like uh, Donald Trump was in uh, serious legal jeopardy, that it uh, may have made some legislators uh, more uh, hesitant Republicans to uh, push certain things. But in terms, and, and, and certainly um, there were people who have, I think, who used it for, um, you know, to inflate their podcast numbers or to uh, promote a, a foreign policy. I mean, that's what happens in politics. People use different things that are happening. But as far as the genesis of it, you have a campaign where they bring on a guy who's been monitored by spy services, you know, Carter Page, who I met and I think is just a, a, rant, a raving lunatic. Uh, and I'm not sure, you know, I would trust him to uh, uh, lead me out of a, uh, you know, a building with two sets of stairs, frankly. Um, but this is a guy that they had been monitoring because of his behavior. And then he joins the Trump campaign. Uh, there are other uh, connections. They, I don't know to what extent you know, you see Felix Sater, and if you know he's an asset at that time, well, then it makes a lot of sense. If you don't know he's an asset, then you start to wonder, like, why is all this money coming into these um, into these tr uh, Trump Towers? Why are all these meetings? Um, I happen to think Donald Trump did not think he was going to win. And in those situations, like, you promise people stuff if you think it's going to help your relationship. That's called business, right? I mean, <laughs> called making deals. Yeah. Hey, Brendan, I I may get a TV show, so uh, why don't you hang out here and uh, put in a couple of extra hours? And when I get that TV show, you're going to be a producer. I don't think I'm going to get the TV show, but uh, Brendan comes in and puts in extra hours, and all of a sudden I get the TV show, and like, oh damn it, I've got to I've got to let Brendan work on the show now. <laughs> I screwed up. But I'm not convinced that wasn't uh, the nature of it. But from the perspective of investigators who are looking into this in the summer of 2015 or 2016, and then the president fires the lead investigator and announces, I needed to get him off, basically, like, I didn't like the fact that he was investigating me. You know, like, I'm not sure what people are supposed to do at that point. Did other people run with it? Absolutely. Um, and and I think people have to be held to account with how far they got out in front of this story. But the story was real. Um, the investigation did exactly what it should do. And in the meantime, 
it also found a lot of uh, malfeasance by a lot of different players, which has been going on, and, and, and I don't think that excuses it, though. I think we should be rounding up more of them. And I don't, you know, whether it's, you know, the whatever firms were, were doing uh, crap like this, I don't know why they weren't rounded up in the first place. I do know why they weren't. Um, so I don't, you know, I have no idea what's in the report at this point. I don't know that we have an accurate reflection from uh, William Barr, who, you know, uh, but I imagine we're going to see parts of the report. Uh, I don't know that I should believe William Barr's assessment that, in fact, Russia interfered in the election. But, you know, like I said from, from day one, of course they did. It would be malfeasance for them not to. We do it. I mean, how could we not be doing this? That's mm -hmm. what's done. And there is a fundamental problem with uh, the country that, uh, uh, you know, allows for that level of interference to even be considered to have any implications on the outcome of an election. There were, you know, uh, 20 different things that I think had gone a different way. Uh, the outcome would have been different. But yes, there's an underlying problem in the country that um, that it would be so close. And, you know, I'm not going to we can have other conversations. We've had millions of them as to what the underlying problems are. But uh, that aside. You know, the idea that this was a hoax from the beginning is ab absurd. Yes, there were people who um, uh, who got out in front of where the uh, the investigation was. Um, but to suggest that the whole thing should have been uh, completely ignored. Like, I mean, I even think like the first Benghazi hearing probably was worthwhile. It was the eighth one uh, that became, you know, somewhere along that uh, spectrum where it became ridiculous and to uh, spend your time uh, covering it would have been a joke. But to have to completely ignore uh, this and to assume that it was um, initiated because of like these weird uh, th these other sort of like narrow agendas like um, and it may be the case that this was exploited to achieve other goals. Definitely. I mean, that's that's what happens all the time. Right. I mean, it's 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 that explained my interest in it. Well, I mean, it 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 it, it does uh, all things people try to use in politics. People try to uh, make a case from uh, Donald Trump's win that uh, we should have a, a different type of Democrat win. And we make those arguments or, you know, be the nominee. Uh, people uh, look at, you know, I mean, this is this is the this is the way that politics work. And you can I think it's a perfectly legitimate criticism to make of the way that this was exploited. Um and I think we did a fairly decent job over the course of this to not, um, you know, uh, reward those who were, I think, transparently or even less transparently trying to uh, use this investigation and get out in front of it uh, in some way. Now, I, I happen to not think that any of this is resolved in any way. Um, I think there's, you know, uh, from the beginning, I think we were talking like most of this is going to come down to financial. I mean, I think we were saying that in, uh, you know, on day one, literally, that it was just going to be stories about money laundering. But that was basically all based upon, uh, you know, some discussions in an interview that we did on this program with, with Wayne Barrett, who has been following Donald Trump and this whole stuff for, for a long time. Um but I can understand why people in Washington might have been like, hey, we're investigating him in a fairly routine uh, thing. And then he fires the <laughs> the head of the FBI. That's weird. It's a little bit weird. Um, and but yes, were there uh, politicians and media figures who basically uh, thought like I'm going to ride this? Yeah, of course. Um, and. You know, they've got to dig themselves out of a hole, but. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people did not die. Millions of people were not uh, made internal and external refugees. Um, we ended up not having World War III. Uh, if we haven't at this point, I don't think we're going to, at least as this is a uh, foundation. Um, 
I'm not saying there weren't uh, bad things that came out of this, but certainly um, no worse than, you know, what's happening to people in Puerto Rico, for God's sakes. There's no comparison. Right. Exactly. The, uh, to the extent that there's been any damage uh, done by this, it's that maybe we don't uh, see as much about what's going on in Puerto Rico. But, you know, to the extent that we do know uh, stuff about Puerto Rico, um, there's, there's a decent crossover by, you know, like, uh, and, uh, you know, I don't, to the extent that I saw the most coverage of Puerto Rico, it mostly came on Hayes' show. Um, and, and then, you know, Nomi Kant's going down there and, you know, uh, the, the democracy now and stuff like this, but it's not like, uh, Fox News was covering a lot of stuff that was going on in Puerto Rico. Um. They were doing white nationalism. Yeah, Tuck Carlson was not uh, featuring the, uh, the the plight of Puerto Ricans uh, and and their lack of electricity. So um, that is um, the media is bad, folks. I think is the conclusion. Yeah, and 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 here's the thing. The I think that is also media. Here's we're the thing good, that I think though. is we're also good. Uh, well, I I think here's the thing. I mean, but we don't do any you know uh, f- uh, firsthand reporting, and, and and everything that we do on this program is uh, contingent upon their being reporters. And uh, so make no mistake about that. We're, we're not, we are not reporters. We are aggregators who assess and, and essentially curate and editorialize based upon reporting that exists. And anybody on YouTube who tells you they're reporting anything is full of garbage. Um, and to the extent that we provide any service, it's, you know, we read it and we make assessments so that you don't have to. And over time you judge whether our assessments and what we present is relevant and at least, um, sound in some manner. And that's the way you should approach all of your, your, your media. Um, and when you find that it's not, then you uh, theoretically act accordingly. Um, yeah, the amount of funding that it takes, the amount of overhead that it takes to go out there and do real reporting in the world is a lot. It's too much for a podcast, certainly, and it scares me that it's drying up. Yes, it, it's very problematic. And um, and I will add that the, the power of cable news is greatly diminished from where it was just even 10, 15 years ago, certainly 20 years ago. Um, In the run-up to the Iraq War, if you looked on page 8 or 10 of the New York Times or the Washington Post or maybe you saw uh, reporting from McClatchy, you could see tells that this, um, the run-up to the Iraq war was full of crap. But it was overwhelmed because there was no mechanism like there is today to amplify those stories, to push back. But social media, the growth of YouTube, which did not exist at that time, uh, but basically social media allowed for people who were, you know, small groups of people, smaller groups of people, to amplify counter-narratives. So it is true there was a lot of people who anticipated um, Mueller to go in there, I guess, and arrest Donald Trump, even though we knew early on that you can't, uh, that according to the DOJ, of which he is a part of as special uh, uh, counsel, you can't indict a sitting president. But there was a lot of motivated reasoning there. And that uh, motivated reasoning was certainly not inhibited in any way by uh, various commentators and and news readers and cable news outlets. But the bottom line is, is that cable news does not have the same power it did then. And it did not lead to um, the... it did not lead, and I don't think there was ever a danger, it seems to me, of leading to, you know, um, people who speak Russian uh, getting beat up in Coney Island or 
and 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 people make a a decent argument that um, that news outlets, various uh, news outlets, were punished in the wake of this. But I will remind you, they were punished or uh, you know uh, singled out, deranked, or uh, smeared in some way, not because of the story that Donald Trump was colluding with uh, the Russian government, but that the Russian government was interfering with the election, which it did. They certainly According tried. to this, well, I mean, I don't know what, I'm not, I don't know that it brought about a different result, but if you're going to believe William Barr, they did. And... Um, just like we should not be doing this with Venezuela or any other country. And I'm not shocked that they did, but they did. And so that becomes a, a pretext to, um, to punish different media outlets. I understand that sucks when there was white nationals, uh, you know, AT&T was ended up, uh, through YouTube, uh, advertising on, uh, on, on Nazi sites. Um, we got demonetized for months. It was scary, uh, but the you know the at the end of the day, the investigation ran its course, found that there was no criminal charges that could be pursued. We're not going to know one third of this story by the end of it. I'm convinced of that. There's going to have been. Uh, fuck ups. There's going to have been cover your ass situations. Um, that's always the case with this. We always see the shadows. We see the reflections. The the outlines. But. Um, I don't see how the government could have reacted. The apparatus could have reacted any differently. I mean at any at any juncture and Trump was obviously very worried about an investigation and it turns out he was probably worried about it for a different reason <laughs> because of other criminal activities he's been up to that were a lot more banal but you start acting that way you know they think you might have a body in the trunk and it turns out all you have is like uh, 10 kilos of, uh, of cocaine. But if you speed off as the cops coming after you, they're, it, they're, they're going to act as if they think, I mean, they thought that you might have a body in the, in the car and you drive down the road and you speed off. They're going to chase you. So, I mean, I think that's a lot of what we, we saw uh, in this instance. And He's then definitely guilty of something. Well, I mean, we know, like, you know, we, and that's, you know, that raises a whole nother set of questions as to like, how is it that this guy got away with all this stuff in New York for so long when you have some very ambitious uh, prosecutors? And that is a story I also don't know that we will. Uh, I think they look to service their ambition elsewhere. Yeah. Well, the question is why? And I think it's probably a different answer depending on who it is. I mean, like we know why, let's say, a guy like Schneiderman maybe, who maybe for reasons like he uh, didn't feel comfortable going after Trump because maybe maybe there's a whole host of people he didn't feel comfortable going after because of, of, uh, of aspects of his personal life and that, you know. Um, but... New York does have a long history of corruption. Uh, indeed. Which, you know, brings up questions once again of the level of influence that money has in politics and oligarchs and all that stuff. Indeed. All right. Well, we got to take a break. Uh, oh, before we do, folks, there's no need to suffer through another sleepless night. Even if you're me. Thanks to Calming Comfort by Sharper Image. The luxurious weighted blanket is made with super soft velveteen material and designed with high density comfort fill to promote a sense of calmness. <laughs> should broadcast with it. Yeah, no kidding. I should actually. We should do that. Plus, by applying an even amount of pressure over your body, calming comfort helps the production of serotonin and melatonin and mimics the soothing feeling of being hugged for a restful night's sleep. 
uh, I can tell you that uh, honestly, it is um, it's made a, a world of difference for me. It's cut my sleeping time. The only, I mean, and I need it when when uh, when Saul comes in and tells me he's peed his bed at like five in the morning. I've got you know an hour of sleep left if I can get back to sleep in like 15, 20 minutes, which is very difficult for me to do. And the calm and comfort weighted blanket that, uh, that I have uh, makes it a lot easier. It immediately just is like, ah. Oh. Calm and comfort weighted blanket comes with a 90-day anxiety-free, stress-free, best night's sleep of your life guarantee from the Sharper Image. Right now, our listeners can go to calmingcomfortblanket.com. Use the promo code MAJORITY at checkout to receive $15 off the displayed price. Again, that's calmingcomfortblanket.com, promo code MAJORITY, because you can't put a price on a great night's sleep. Calmingcomfortblanket.com, promo code MAJORITY. Also, you should know, and you probably, well, maybe you don't know how often, but every two seconds there's a new victim of identity theft, which means a criminal could be spending your money applying for loans in your name, even damaging your credit the good credit you've worked so hard to build. Unfortunately, you can miss certain threats to your identity by just checking bank statements and monitoring your credit. Good thing there's LifeLock Identity Theft Protection. LifeLock uses proprietary technology to detect and alert you to a wide range of identity threats like your social security number uh, for sale on the dark web. And if you have an issue involving identity theft, one of LifeLock's identity restoration specialists will work to fix it. Of course, no one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. But with LifeLock, you get identity theft protection and additional features to help protect your devices against cyber threats for as low as $9.99 a month. Don't waste another second. Visit LifeLock.com slash majority now to save 10% on your first year. That's LifeLock.com slash majority for 10% off. LifeLock.com slash majority. Quick break and we come back. Pat Garofalo on the billionaire boondoggle. How are politicians like corporations and bigwigs steal our money and jobs? Right back. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome the managing editor of Talk Poverty, the author of The Billionaire Boondoggle, How Our Politicians Let Corporations and Bigwigs Steal Our Money and Jobs. Pat Garofalo, welcome back. Long time, I think, uh, to the show. Thank you so much. It has been a while. It has. Um, now, Look, I wasn't going to start with this, but I just saw a story that just, uh, I don't know how I, I came across this. Um, but uh, the American Dream, the Mega Mall uh, in New Jersey, which I have been following through, I think this is the eighth uh, name that they have given this thing. Um, the opening, and this is going to come as a huge shock, is likely pushed back to the fall. Uh, apparently... <laughs> The mega, the mega mall in the Meadowlands uh, was supposed to open, I guess, like any day now or something. But now it's coming in the fall of 2019. Let's start there because you write about uh, a a dynamic that covers Amazon. It covers the building of uh, sports arenas. Uh, it cover, covers the retail uh, enticements. Um 
It covers uh, film and movie stuff, which is where I really wanted to start. But I had to start with the American Dream. Tell us the story of the American Dream, since you are a uh, New Jerseyite yourself. Yeah, one more sad trombone for the American Dream. I'm I'm, I'm stunned they pushed it back again. Um, so this is a project. It's supposed to be a sort of new age mall. It's going to be this giant mall thing with like amusement parks and ski slopes and all sorts of stuff inside it. Um, and the idea was that people are going to actually leave New York because they've become bored there with the, the old few things to do in that city um, and go out to New Jersey and shop at this giant mega mall in the Meadowlands. Um, and New Jersey has been trying to get this thing off the ground for literally years. Um, they started it basically just as the financial crisis hit. Hold on, um, when, wait a second. I just got to ask, uh, will there be a TGIF there? Because if that's it, that's going to seal the deal for me. I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe you have to go pitch them on that. There we go. So, <laughs> so this starts... Um, and it's just gone through through various iterations, um, and, and it just keeps getting pushed back and back and back. And it's one of those things that I write about in the book where in cities and states get themselves in trouble on these sorts of projects, and instead of saying, eh, well, maybe this is a bad idea, they just keep doubling and tripling and quadrupling down on them. So, all right. So, uh, and at one point it was uh, called Xanadu. I think that's the way it launched. Is it launched as Xanadu? But I, if I remember correctly, Chris Christie, who was governor at the time, threw a ton of cash at this thing while simultaneously saying, "We're not going to build uh, the uh, the other tunnel." They wanted to build another tunnel between mm-hmm. New Jersey and New York. Uh, they were getting a ton of federal funds to do it, and he was like, "The the state can't afford it." Of course, um, we are, you know, the idea of the one tunnel going underneath the Hudson River um, uh, shutting down for any period of time would be catastrophic for, like, the economy of New Jersey and, frankly, uh, in many respects of New York and for people's daily lives. Um, But yet they sunk um, money into this. Like, what, what is that dynamic? Yeah, so so Chris Christie really loved him some corporate tax breaks. Um, he he gave out more than any previous New Jersey governor, at something to the tune of four billion dollars, um, and and yeah, not just to the the American Dream Mall. Um, sorry, excuse me. Sorry, what was the question? I've totally totally lost my train of thought. Well, I mean, the whole idea was, I mean, just like what the the dynamic there, like what was it supposed to do? What you you give that kind of money to the mall? What is it supposed to do? The idea is that this will be an economy booster, right? People are going to come, and they're going to shop, and they're going to have a good time. And that's the theory behind not just malls, but sports stadiums and um, hockey arenas and bringing the Olympics to your city and all that good stuff. Um, And all the economic evidence shows that this is totally bonkers and that none of the effects that you say are going to happen actually happen. And New Jersey is actually a really good, instructive place to look at because the new governor, Governor Phil Murphy, um, initiated a review of all the corporate tax incentive programs that were going on in New Jersey and found that there was literally zero accountability going on. These programs were chugging along for years and years, and no one was going back and checking to see if they were actually effective. When they finally pulled all the numbers up, there was something like 3,000 jobs that were showing up on one ledger and not showing up on another ledger, and no one can figure out what happened. And that's emblematic of these programs all over the country. Cities and states spend tens of billions of dollars annually throwing money at corporations with little to no idea if there's any impact, little to no accountability, and oftentimes just no transparency to the public. Something like half of the cities and counties that do this literally don't list the recipients of the tax breaks. They just say, hey, we gave $25 million to some folks. So, all right. So, walk us through the taxonomy of 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 what we're talking about here. Are we talking about direct payments? Are we talking about money that was not collected? And how do you measure like the cost of that? I mean, that was one of the arguments about the Amazon thing that we hear from people is like, the this is money that we're only collecting based upon the activity that Amazon does. And if they aren't here, we're not going to collect that money. I mean, what's the, what's the what's the response to that? So there's a lot of different ways um, these things happen. The most popular one is actually just property tax breaks. Um, You say to an Amazon or to a sports team owner, hey, if you put your thing here, you don't have to pay property taxes on uh, the land. Um, But a lot of times they often are just cash grants. Um, Sometimes they're cash grants per job created. Sometimes they're just, 
hey, here's some money, build a thing. Um, oftentimes they're infrastructure supporting um, whatever the thing is in question, which is a, a big problem with Amazon, you know, the helipad and all the stuff that they were going to build up there. Um, so this money comes in a variety of forms. But my, my main point of contention, I guess, is that there's a huge opportunity cost here, right? Cities and states have to balance their budgets. They're not the federal government. They can't print money. Most of them are constitutionally obligated um, to balance their budgets. And so every dollar you spend on one of these things is a dollar that you can't spend on the stuff that actually matters to people on your education system, on your infrastructure, on delivering clean water, um, the sorts of things that cities and states are supposed to do. So, all right, but but where, I mean, um, walk me through this dynamic. All right, for, all right let's take uh, the film business because I've always like, you know, um, I, I've looked at, you know, there, there's, there's two sites, but there, well, I mean, you can tell us about the types of subsidies uh, that, that, that the film business gets, but if I'm in Michigan, right. And uh, for instance, and, or, or Louisiana or wherever it is, these, these happen all around the country. There's no film business here. Um, and, uh, I'm the governor and I say, well, we're going to, we're going to give you these, these guys a tax break if they come here. I mean, what, what happens with the film people? Uh, and, yeah. and, and then we'll talk about the results. Totally. So there's, there are two big dynamics to talk about here. One is you're paying companies to do things they would have done anyway. And that's what happened in the case of Amazon, right? There are really good reasons for Amazon to be in DC and New York, and you don't have to pay them to do that. But on the flip side of that coin is something like film and uh, TV tax credits, where you say, hey, we don't have a film industry. Let's pay some money to producers to put their productions here, and we'll create one. The problem with that latter plan is that particularly the movie business, but lots of industries are so transient. And so they will just chase the money. And so you end up paying higher and higher amounts just to keep whatever you have. Louisiana was the first state to do this in a big way. In about 2002, they went whole hog on movie productions. And for a while, the most feature films made anywhere in the country were made in Louisiana, which is wild if you think about you know the advantages that California and New York have. Um, but then other states started piling in after and said, hey, stop filming in Louisiana, come to my state. And now actually most feature film production is in Georgia because they were willing to pay more for it. And because these productions can basically go anywhere and make anywhere look like anywhere else, you don't need to be in New York to have your set look like New York, you end up in this competitive economic purgatory where you're just paying more and more and more and then literally being held hostage by these productions. I was living in Baltimore when the Maryland legislature paid a ton of money to have House of Cards and Veep filmed in Maryland. Uh, and California came along and said, hey, Veep, we'll give you $5 million more than Maryland will. Come film in California. And they were gone. Poof. There's nothing left. Um, and so that's the problem with these film things is the business is so transient that you can just move it whenever another uh, someone comes along willing to pay more money. But that's not the that's not the only problem. Right. Because uh, and I remember this dynamic, um, you know, uh, back when I was in the business, there was uh, I, I was EPing a show that was supposed to be shot in New York. And they're like, we're going to do it in Vancouver uh, because. Um, they're going to give us huge uh, tax breaks and incentives, and uh, that's where you know we're going to, sh or maybe Toronto. I guess it was Toronto. Um, but but the the problem is, I mean, it's one thing if you give them, and it's ta we're talking about tax breaks, right, or tax credits, like, uh, and, and I want you to talk about how those work. But the bottom line is, the there you, you give five million dollars to a production. The problem is, is that it doesn't create what it's supposed to create in terms of like activity. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's the, the second big problem with these things, in addition to being constantly held hostage. And if you think about it, these jobs are going to be by necessity, right, sort of short term, um, and they aren't going to last for years on end. The production is going to be there for a little while, and then it's not. And so what oftentimes happens with these programs is that um, the production comes in and they maybe hire some off-duty police officers to work security or they hire some hairdressers from the nearby salon to work um, on to doing folks' hair, um, and those get called jobs created, right? But they're not really. They're just jobs shuffled around. Um, so some percentage of the quote, 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 created jobs will just wind up being that. You're just renting positions for a little while. And maybe that off-duty police officer gets a little more cash, and that's nice, um, but that's not a new job. Um, so that is one of the, the major problems with this. And then the second major problem is that some percentage of the money you spend is inevitably going to go to out-of-state folks, right? Some of that money is going to subsidize Ben Affleck's salary. Some of that money is going to subsidize flying-in producers from Hollywood to work for a few weeks and then leave. Um, 
And that just doesn't create very much. You can sort of see how that's not building anything long-term and sustainable, even if that money does circulate in the local economy for a short period of time, which I am dubious of, and I don't think it really does. Um, it's just a sugar high, and, and you're not building the foundation for long-term sustainable growth. Okay, so why doesn't that, I mean, I, so I, it makes sense that uh, the the nature of a film production uh, could be so um, uh, flighty that literally flighty uh, that um, <laughs> it's not going to provide any long term growth. But but what about um, you know like why why doesn't it work with the mall? Is it just that the numbers don't give up, or is it that like there's an opportunity? I mean, because here's the dynamic that that I think you know I, I want you to tease out here is that um, if it is just taxes not collected, how do we know that there would be something else there that would generate taxes? Yeah, totally. Um, so a couple other problems that we haven't talked about. One is when you end up paying a corporation to do things, some of the money ends up inevitably leaking out of the local community, right? So in the case of an Amazon, some percentage of the money they collect is going to leave the community and go back to Seattle or go to Jeff Bezos' tax haven or whatever, right? So some of that money is going to go out. Um, but the other factor to get at here is that there are things you can do that build long-term sustainable growth for everyone that will get you that revenue in the end, right? The problem with so many of these deals, I actually had a guy from Memphis um, write to me the other day to complain about his city's um, penchant for doing these deals. And what he said to me, and it was really striking, was what these deals say to me is that our leaders think we have no value as a community. And there's really something to that, right? You're, what you're essentially saying, what your lawmakers are essentially saying when they engage in these deals is there's literally no reason a corporation would ever want to be here unless we pay them a bribe. Um, and it really, the dynamic should be flipped. You should be doing the sorts of things, building up your education system, building up your infrastructure, having the highest quality of life possible, whether that's through childcare or paid leave or whatever the case may be, and saying, no, it's a privilege for your business to be here. We're not going to go begging for scraps. And those are the sorts of things that will, over the long run, entice businesses in and get you that money and create the sort of widespread growth that's for everyone, not just for like some tech bros to come in and work their $125,000 jobs, which is great for them, but doesn't really help everybody in the long term. And again, you're not building anything sustainable. You're just building some stuff until the next guy comes along and, and yoinks it with a higher tax subsidy. But what do you say about the, 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 the fictional uh, Memphis, right, that doesn't have the cash? And, um, you know, uh, so Amazon's going to come in. We're going to say you don't have to pay any property taxes. Uh, we're going to um, we're going to expend, you know, some amount of money to build better roads around there so that, you know, your executives will be able to drive and not have a bumpy road. Uh, and you know, you guys will be able to flush your toilets in the, the building that you build and uh, all at the same time and it won't explode, that type of thing. Uh, and, uh, and I'm a politician now and I'm selling it to you as a constituent. And what's going to happen is not only are they going to hire people, but um, they're going to create, uh, you know, uh, they're going to give money to uh, workers and workers are going to go out and buy more stuff. And then there are going to be other businesses that will come and we'll charge them taxes. Uh, I mean, what, what's wrong with that scenario? Yeah, the problem is that that just doesn't happen in the real world. Every academic researcher who has looked at this has found that that's just not what occurs. The money doesn't circulate that way. Those taxes never wind up coming in. The, that's a real problem with these things is that that story you just told, that sounds right, right? Like that in your gut feels correct. And then you have like, you know, pointy headed econ wonks coming along and being like, oh, well, no, actually, there are all these ancillary effects you need to womp, 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 take into account. And, and we sound ridiculous. Um, so that is the difficulty of, of trying to argue against these things is saying, hey, everyone who's gone and looked at these deals over and over again, cities and states across the country, that effect just simply doesn't happen. You don't end up getting that money. You don't end up attracting new businesses. You just end up shuffling workers around from job to job and not really creating anything new. Um, but it's a really hard narrative to fight back against. And we've been told for you know, decades from Democrats, Republicans, everyone in between, um, that this is the way to build an economy. So we're really fighting against this myth that's been built that the way to create growth and prosperity is to rain money down on big corporations, and then they're going to be really nice and hire some folks. Um, and it just doesn't work that way. And uh, one of the one of the um, the there's another reason uh, that you write that the that that, that this myth is so durable um, is that it actually it gets you votes if you're a politician. Yeah, this is the most surprising thing um, that came up in my research for the book is that they, these things work as a, as a political incentive. Um, lawmakers who engage in more attempts to work out corporate tax deals 
get a higher share of the vote. Um, one researcher looked at elected mayors versus unelected mayors at the city level, expecting that unelected mayors would be a little more profligate with these sort of things because they're less accountable. And it actually wasn't the case. It was the elected mayors um, who, were, who did more of these deals than the unelected mayors who towed the line and said no. Um, that does make a certain amount of sense if you think about it because there are – political things worth having that come out of these deals, right? You get to send out the press release saying, hey, Amazon's coming here and it's going to create all these jobs. You get to have your photo taken and put on the front page of the local Times Gazette, whatever. Um, you get to go out and shake hands with Jeff Bezos. In the case of movies, you get to go out and you know parade Ben Affleck or Kevin Spacey pre-scandal um, around town, which is exactly what has happened with House of Cards in Maryland. Um, and so those things are really worth something in political capital, and then you can punt the long-term costs down the road to the next guy i mean that's basically the story of foxconn isn't it and uh, scott walker absolutely that's that, that was all 100%. basically this is how i'm going to run for president uh this is going to be the the part that makes me look like a job creator yeah and actually actually that was an interesting example because the flip happened right he did this job he did this thing and people actually looked pretty closely at it not just because of walker but because trump got involved um and said hey this deal actually looks really shady and it's not great. And then when Foxconn itself came out and said, oh, hey, we're not actually going to create all those jobs, you know, things really did fall apart for Walker. Um, and I think you'd argue the same thing with Amazon where and it was so high profile that um, it got a lot of political attention. Um, and therefore, at least in New York, the deal got scuttled. That's really atypical. That doesn't happen with most of these deals. Most of the time, if anyone finds out about them at all, it's years later. I would compare the Amazon case to what Google has been doing, which is just going around the country, hoovering up tax breaks using shell companies, not really admitting that, that's, that it's Google that's behind all this, um, and no one pays attention to that. And that sort of stuff happens every day, all the time. I am mildly encouraged, actually, that Trump keeps sticking his nose into the middle of these things. It's not just Foxconn. It's Carrier. Um, because he is bringing scrutiny just because of who he is and because he has this like deal maker in chief shtick and the deals keep falling apart, he's bringing a level of scrutiny to these things that really didn't exist before. When I started writing this book in 2016, um, I was much more discouraged about there ever being a, a solution to this. Um, I'm actually feeling much better than I have in years about these sort of things. Uh, Amazon really uh, sort of provided all of the elements of your argument on some level, didn't it? I mean, just like including not just from a politician standpoint, but also that that question of desperation as they went around. Just I mean, talk about that dynamic, because there are some places that are just like they will literally do anything uh, to have something different happen. Absolutely. I think you can't discount the economic um, like context that we are in. Right. There are lots of places that because of bad industrial policy and bad trade deals and bad antitrust policy letting these giant corporate monoliths get created really are desperate and really have nothing and if they're one company towns they're lucky they're oftentimes zero company towns um, and so even the people the local officials at that level who do understand what's going on and do get it and like realize that this means in 20 years that the playground is going to fall down and the school's roof is going to collapse and they're not going to have any money to deal with it say you know what but right now if we give a bunch of money to say bass pro shop to come here and create 30 jobs uh, that's 30 more jobs than we had yesterday and and we'll figure out the rest later so there is that element of desperation in a lot of these deals even amongst the people who acknowledge this is bad and it's going to cost us in the long run but like darn it we need something today what well, well, what about like a place like Detroit? Like, you know, like, I mean, and, and Amazon, I mean, now I think the proof is in the pudding to a certain extent. Amazon had no interest uh, as a company. And I think, you know, people uh, will attest to this to, in Seattle. They, they're not they don't want to be the company that's responsible for building a community or for supporting a community. Um, they uh, and I think, you know, going into Queens, they they can they can hide in terms of like their their court their their citizen responsibility to the uh, to the community, and of course they would argue they don't have one because it's it's a completely a fiduciary one. But but what about like if you're Detroit, like could something like that work for Detroit, where it's just like come in, we'll give you land. I mean Detroit seems to me like a maybe a special case. I mean would it be problematic there? You know, they just tried it, and it was a sports thing, so it wasn't like an Amazon thing. They just tried it with the Detroit Red Wings Arena, which was supposed to turn into this whole downtown business district. Um, Mike Illich, I believe his name is, he's the owner of the of the Red Wings, got this deal in motion a long time ago. Um, and it just hasn't 
worked. Um, and I think it goes back to the problems we were talking about before. When you end up sort of laundering public money through corporations and expecting them to be nice and create all this stuff, um, the dynamics just don't work the way that our sort of gut tells us that they will. Um, I, I wouldn't say never for a place like that that really needs something, anything. Um, but oftentimes those deals end up as, as the worst because the corporation realizes it sort of has the, you know, it has the city over the barrel and can, and can get the best possible term. Um, and that's the problem with these deals writ large, right? There's always going to be a race to the bottom as long as they exist. And there's always going to be someone who's willing to give a little more. And so that's why even a place that's super desperate winds up giving away the store or the farm or whatever your you know, analogy of the moment is. I guess it's possible, but the history of these things has been that it just hasn't, even if you're talking about really economically distressed areas, they just end up giving away whatever little is left of their tax base and then not seeing the benefits. So... Um... What, uh, what is the solution? Is it just simply a, 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 a changing or introducing people to the reality uh, as opposed to the narrative? I mean, we see this still with sports arenas, uh, you know, and I got to admit, like, you know, there was uh, the, the, the Pawtucket Red Sox are coming to uh, Worcester. Uh, and uh, they're going to become the uh, the Wo Sox or the Woo Sox or something like that. And you know, I mean, I I don't live in Worcester anymore. Uh, I have family there, and but I'm excited. And then I'm like, oh, Worcester is giving them I don't know twenty million dollars or something like that, and that just seems ridiculous to me. Um, but I'm torn because I'm a you know I'm a Red Sox fan. But what what? What what is the solution to this? Is it just simply raising the awareness of citizens, or is there is there actually some type of like some type of policy solution? Yeah, I'll, I'll get back to the solutions in a second, but I, I definitely feel you on that dynamic because here in D.C., where I live, um, we paid 150 million dollars to build D.C. United Stadium, which is our uh, major league soccer team. And I'm a huge soccer fan, and the new stadium is beautiful, and I really like going. Um, but you sort of have to try and disconnect that right from from the, the wider policy. It's like, this is really good for me, but ugh, I really wish we could have put that into the metro or the healthcare system or any of other DC's many problems. Um, we're actually having a fight here over the one public skating rink in the city, and they can't find the money to fix that up, yet they managed to find the money to build a stadium for not just DC United, but also for the Washington Nationals. Um, so I feel you, and, and sports is the really hard one because these teams are supposed to be right part of the fabric of the community and, you know, a, a civic institution and sports owners do leave if they don't get their stadiums built. So it can be really hard. You never want to be the mayor who loses, you know, the Baltimore Colts or who loses the Seattle Supersonics or whatever the case may be. Um, so those are tough ones. You know, you, you love your sports team and your sports team doesn't love you back. And you just got to remember that um, as to the big solutions. So in theory, Congress could knock this all off tomorrow if it wanted to. If Congress passed a one-page bill that said, henceforth, all uh, state and local corporate tax incentives are hereby taxed at 125%. Boom, done, forget it, it's over. You know, now cities are going to have, cities and states are going to have to compete on something else. I am not super optimistic that is going to happen. Um, so honestly, I do think the best remedy is awareness, and it's like a sort of sad, unsexy answer. Um, just letting people know that this happens. And the reason I wrote the book as I did um, and focusing it mostly on entertainment titans was because I really wanted to drive home that this is your favorite sports team. This is the TV show you watch at night when you're on Netflix. This is the mall you drop in. You know, this is the hotel your mom stays in when she comes to visit. This is the stuff that's in your community all the time, and it's your elected officials who are giving it away. Um, and yeah, that's just a pretty unsatisfying answer. But but the Amazon thing has given me a little hope. Uh, Boston saying no to the Olympics uh, in 2020 gave me a little bit of hope. The way that things happened with Foxconn gave me a little bit of hope. Um, so you know, you just got to fight these deals one deal at a time, unless and until Congress comes in and and, and Godzilla stomps the whole thing. Pat Garofalo, the book is The Billionaire Boondoggle, How Our Politicians Let Corporations and Bigwigs Steal Our Money and Jobs. We'll put a link at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Anytime. All right. All right, folks. Head into the fun half. Just a reminder, you can support this program and join us in the fun half by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Jointhemajorityreport.com. Uh, for just pennies a day. Also, just coffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. 
Uh, today is Tuesday. Uh, Michael's not here, but I'm sure he'll uh, show up for a show. Uh, and uh, Matt Taibbi will be here today. Uh, he'll be on. We'll we have a, we're gonna, I think we're going to pre-record the interview with him, and then Ben Burgess also on. There you go. Um, and uh, Jamie, the Intifada. Yeah. So uh, out tomorrow, we have an episode breaking down what's going on with Brexit. I think a lot of people uh, in the U.S. probably don't understand it that well, and I learned a lot actually talking about the Brexit with. Sean and our guest Nero. And um, also, we recorded a bonus wherein we talked to some of our patrons over the phone. And uh, that was really cool and really special. And we just hit our goal of 666 patrons. So, uh, yeah, you're gonna, gonna do a sound effect? Oh, sorry. <laughs> you looked like you were going for the button. Yeah, so I feel I feel very special and very happy that we have been able to do this for about a year now. That's so great. Th thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank oh. you, Matt, for helping us get set up. It's, Our it's pleasure. Good. Matt? A literary hangover just recorded a barn burner of an episode last <laughs> night with, uh, <laughs> with Alex, Alex uh, my regular co-host, and David Griscom of uh, The Michael Brooks Show on The Soul of Man Under Socialism by Oscar Wilde, which uh, it's going to be a long one, but uh, look forward to that. So check out Literary Hangover, get caught up before that comes up. Yeah, you better, folks, because that's a barn burner. Yep. Big socialist, Oscar Wilde. All he, right. He's actually more of a socialist. He's an anarchist, is what he oh, said. Oh, hey. So you'd, you'd actually appreciate that. Cool. But although he's less utopian than... That's why he's always burning down the barns. Well, he says he, he's, more, he's an anarchist, but the dynamite policy is absurd. So... Mm. All right, folks, see you in the fun half.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Let's go to the phones. Calling from an 845 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 845. Hello? Hello, 845. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, it's uh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey? Where are you calling yep. from? Rockland County. Rockland County. And what's on your mind, Jeffrey? What's on my mind? I want to talk about the... Um, Elon Omar situation. It's going to be fairly quick. I got to go to work soon. But I wanted to uh, say that. Do you guys think there was some sort of? Uh, I mean, I don't think it just started with Elon Omar with the whole, you know, accusing her of anti-Semitism for criticizing Israel. I think it started also with what happened. I mean, I, I see like there's like a there's a line to it. It's like it starts with you know Mark Lamont Hill, right, and then all of a sudden. There was that news that came out. I mean, it was on, I remember Roland Martin. I don't know if you remember Roland Martin. Yeah, yeah, I do. He still has yeah. a show on, uh, I think it's Network One. I'm not sure what, where. But... No, he does, his, he does his own, like, internet show. Yeah, thing no, now. I'm familiar with it. We've tried to actually yeah. get him on, uh, we just had scheduling issues. But, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. and then he, there was something else with uh, Angela Davis. She was, like, a famous civil right. rights yes. person. Yes. She was talking about Yeah. Yeah, so there was that situation, and then there was the Tamika Mallory thing. Right. And I noticed that there was this thing that it's almost like you have to look at those three to see, like, the pattern, because one of the reasons why I think also, like, with the whole Elon Omar thing, she got defended over um, by in Congress because I think it was – I think the Congressional Black Caucus yep. were basically, like, arguing with Nancy Pelosi, saying, yep. like, why are, you, why are you attacking her? Yep. And I think that was one of the reasons why the Democrats sort of just backed off and did the resolution as right. tame as it was prior, because the Congressional Black Caucus were realizing, and they just simply asked. Hey, I don't know if it, I don't know if it was all. I, I don't know if it was all the CBC, but they certainly were out in front. I don't think of it was all. This. But but I mean, no, yeah. I'm saying I'm saying like I think there was also pushback from um, from non CBC members. I think there was just like broadly yeah, a pushback from members of the caucus, but. But yeah, go ahead. So, uh, what's your what's your point? No, I was just I just found it interesting that the people that the that the people who were accusing of anti semitism all happened to be you know they're all black folks and and it was it was kind of strange um, that uh, especially what happened with um, the Angela Davis situation because they tried to get her award rescinded. Uh huh. And um, I know that they they changed it back because it was because uh you know they saw the, the backlash of what happened right so um so yeah i mean i would like to say that with the elon omar thing i just th thought that do you guys think like it doesn't just start with her it was, it, no like, i agree it was, like, i agree like, and continue look i mean first off i think there's there's a couple of dynamics going on here the um the israel is worried that it is losing support in the United States, and rightly so. Yeah, we saw this going back to when, and part of it was even just like when uh, you know the Republican Congress invited uh, Netanyahu to speak, and you started to see like defectors, like yeah. guys like Tim Kaine, saying, "I'm not going to go uh, to Congress." And this yeah. is, and, and yeah. that was the beginning, and certainly through Obama. And uh, you know, we've done enough interviews where we understand that Obama. Um, the the existence of a uh, of a black president, um, you know, racialized a lot of things for a lot of people, um, you know, yeah. and which is not to say they weren't racialized before, but even more so as, as stunning as that sounds, at least that's what the data suggests. And Donald Trump certainly, um, you know, he made his political career, his bona fides were on that very dynamic, you know, uh, you know, claiming that uh, Barack Obama was some type of other because he was from a different country. So you have this dynamic yeah. that's floating out there. Uh, you also have uh, this dynamic of, of Israel worried that its support is starting to uh, falter. And uh, frankly, the, the, the reality is, is that in the context of our society, it is much easier to uh, pile on a black person, you know, in public. I mean, that's just it's just it, it, you have not only do you ha you have the momentum that comes and, you know, there's a lot of anti-Semitism that's floating around now. I would argue it's coming from the right. Yeah. 
uh, but it's there. Yeah. It's in the consciousness. And then you have people who are attempting to speak up for, uh, you know, in particular Palestinian rights, or they're speaking up about the outsized uh, influence that uh, the Israeli uh, lobby has in this country. And, and, and yeah. as an example, you know, like this is what and, and I'm going to cover this right now, actually, but I appreciate the call. I think there is something to this because yeah, well, it is um, it is easier to uh, leverage the um, this argument that uh, critiques on Israel are anti-Semitic almost de facto. If, uh, frankly, a person of color is providing the fulcrum in our society. That's the sad truth. And so you get stuff like this. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer going up. Listen to how Nancy Pelosi mischaracterizes. And this keeps happening over and over and over again. Alan Omar never, never, ever said anything, never said the words dual loyalty, never said not loyal to America, she never said, um, uh, you know, dual filthy uh, or uh, whatever it is. There was no dual. She was saying that I do not have to pledge my allegiance to another country. And she was specifically, specifically referring to SR1, Senate Resolution 1, the first bill introduced in the new Senate in January, which was looking to federalize the laws in 27 states around the country that say you as a contractor who is looking to get money from the state, your, your speech therapist who's going in to teach kids in a school, you're a newspaper that is taking ads from a, uh, a, a state university, you need to literally sign a pledge saying that you will not engage in an organized protest against Israel. This is absurd. And there's every reason to believe that it's unconstitutional, but they this was the first bill introduced in the Senate. So when she says, I don't need to sign a pledge to show my allegiance to another country, she is referring to the literal pledge that uh, Marco Rubio wanted to introduce as, well, did introduce as the first Senate resolution that federal contractors need to sign a pledge to not protest against Israel. And it has been mischaracterized over and over and over again because when you complain about having to sign a literal pledge, I don't care what the country is, do you pledge not to protest Saudi Arabia? Are you kidding me? That does not fit into an anti-Semitic trope. But dual loyalty does. So they change it to dual loyalty. Even Nancy Pelosi does that. Policy that reaffirms Israel's right to self-defense. In our democratic societies, we should welcome legitimate debate on how best to honor our values and to advance our priorities without questioning loyalty or patriotism. <laughs> this month, the full house came together to condemn the anti-Semitic myth of dual loyalty and all forms of bigotry with a resolution that, quote, rejects the perpetuation of anti-Semitic stereotypes in the United States and around the world, including the pernicious myth of dual loyalty and foreign allegiance, especially in the context of support for the United States-Israel alliance. All right. So now she's slippery here in the way that she's doing this, but she is not spending an iota of effort to uh, clarify the situation. She is allowing and, perp and perpetuating this myth that Alan Omar had anything to say about dual loyalty. She had nothing to say about dual loyalty. She was saying, I should not be forced to, ple to pledge to another country. And there was a literal <laughs> law resolution on the Senate floor 
calling for just that. Wow, that's pretty gaslighty. Uh, it's super gaslighty. And I'll tell you something. It's literally like it is, uh, it's a liable. Here's Chuck Schumer going on at the same APAC conference, uh, spreading the same stuff. And it is an easy look. The reality is, I don't, I'm not saying this of all the people in that room. I'm not maybe saying it for the majority of the people in that room. But there is, there is a, an openness to a certain amount of Islamophobia that I can assure you is in, a, is in action in this room. So you're going to crap on Alan Omar, then you, you're okay. You're not going to bring up Thomas Friedman saying the same thing about uh, how APAC, uh, their money will help you in a race. You're not going to talk about that because it's not going to have the same, um, it's not going to have the same stickiness in that room. Well, they have to dehumanize Muslims in order to do what Israel is doing to them right now. That's right. Here's Chuck Schumer. When someone names only prominent Jews as trying to buy or steal our elections, we must call it out. When someone says that being Jewish and supporting Israel means you're not loyal to America, we must call it out. Pause it. The first instance happened. The first instance happened by a member of Congress. Several Republican members of Congress. The second instance never happened. Not by anybody who said it in public. Not by any member of Congress. So equating the hypothetical with the literal is very problematic here. To America, we must call it out. When someone looks at a neo-Nazi rally and sees some very fine people among its company, we must call it out. When there's someone suggests that money drives support for Israel, we must call it out. Pause it. First instance, Donald Trump. Maybe there's nice people in there. People can decide. But the fact that money does not drive support for Israel or at least edify the inability of people. And this is what she said. She was talking about her inability to critique Israel. And why would she have inability to critique Israel? Because of the lobbyists that come up and literally end up getting her censured or an attempt to for critiquing Israel. So that's the dynamic that's going on, this false equivalency. And I'll tell you something. Again, I've said this many times. As a supporter of Israel, of its right to exist, this is the stuff that is going to um, be the most damaging to those prospects. This is the stuff that's going to end up isolating Israel more than anything else. You don't allow uh, uh, criticism. Is, uh, the United States, for a very long time, functioned as a bulwark against the worst inclinations of Israel. Because they're, they're in every country, right? Every country has some bad inclinations and some good inclinations. And the United States was often used as a ballast by the Israeli government of like what was constraining them, despite the fact that some elements of their society wanted it, despite the fact that they have a parliamentary system of, of government and more often uh, they had to have right-wing elements within that, uh, that government. During the Bush years, that fell apart. Because the Bush administration was actually pushing the Israeli government to do worse. And we are now seeing the implications of that. And when you don't have the ability to allow for crit critique, when you try and suppress that critique, uh, bad things happen. It's not going to end well in terms of Israel. I mean, if you want uh, Israel to get support from the United States... This is the worst type of situation that you could want, because this is what this is how this is. I mean, and 
And it's been clear for, for years that this is where it was going. Well, when that is your first priority, like a, a, a blindly pro-Israel policy, you end up allying yourself with some very bad bedfellows, right? Like the Trump administration and the right wing in Israel and all kinds of really, really creepy right wing authoritarians who openly espouse anti-Semitism. Even if it wasn't, even if it was, I mean, that's true. And, but even if it wasn't uh, ending up associating you with them, any type of blind, uh, any type of blind support is problematic because, you know, you, you're not seeing what's happening. <laughs> and so you have no way of course correcting. For a long time prior to the Civil War, there was a rule against debating slavery in, the, in Congress. And look how that turned out. Dampened those uh, abolitionists down, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, that's very apt. Um, let's go to the phones. Calling from a 360 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, Sam. It's uh, John from Ferndale, Washington. Um, love the show. Uh, I've listened to you since, you know, back in the day and everything. Um, I'm 57 and ex military, but I'm gay. So, you know, I'm kind of liberal, but. Uh, the talk of anarcho-communism terrifies me as much as, like, right-wing junta. You know, we got, what, 30, 35 years left before global warming kills us all? I'm down with socialism. But honestly, I think you're scaring away people, when, not you, but the show is, when people mention anarchy and communism. Um, and I, I think it's something to like rethink. I, I, I would vote for Bernie tomorrow. Uh, I'm, I'm, I would have voted him for him four years ago. You know, socialism. I mean, we already have, already have social security. We're a democratic, you know, uh, society. But this, this stuff about anarcho communism and Jamie, I, I, I love you. I think you're funny. I love your podcast, the Antifa thing, but man, you got to lay off that because it, it, you're, well, you're well, going to scare people right into the arms of Trump, I right, think. All right. Well, first off, I can tell you just from a just a pure I mean, I can make a pure assessment as to uh, I don't think that um, the hearing the words anarcho-communism and I, you know, I am not an anarcho-communist. I think uh, Jamie is. Um, uh, but I don't think hearing the words themselves are scaring people. I mean, if people hearing a word on this program scares them away from the program, then they don't. They, it's they, the concept, Sam. It's not just the word. Well, but the, but and it's I mean, anti-constitutional. Well, but I, I listen, I'm I I am not in favor of anarcho-communism. I do not think that we are even um, remotely in if you're, you know, uh, in danger uh, of becoming an anarcho-communist society. I think that um, I think that in a society where we can't even get a single payer health insurance program, the concern, if anyone out there in the sound of my voice has concern for the um, the eminent rise, imminent rise of anarcho-communism, I would tell you, that you are worried about the wrong things. Uh, that is not happening uh, anytime soon. I think when uh, Jamie talks about this uh, and her aspirations for that, I have a feeling that they are. That's a rather long horizon. Uh, but I will let J Jamie address that. But I, I think honestly, like, um, I, I think you're you might be overreacting a little bit to it. I don't think that's going to happen. Thing. I just fear. I fear that Fox News is going to take sound bites from your show, and whether she's serious about it or not, or, or or you are. I mean, I love your show. I listen to it every day. I love your tedious talks about Social Security. I really do. Uh, what do you mean and by I don't tedious? want to see anything happen to the show. No, I understand. I mean, I just I, I, people I can take it out of context. If if and scare away uh, scare away voters. If Fox News wants to come on and uh, have me on. To uh, discuss the uh, anarcho-communist nature of this show, I am perfectly happy. They won't. To They'll pull sound right. from the show. They won't have you on because then it would be fair and you could explain right. your ideas. But they'll pull sound from your show, 
And whether it's kidding or not, I'm telling you, um, anarchy and communism scares old folks. And I'm, you know, I'm, I got my toe in, in that door being, being, being 57. Right, I understand. It, it I can tell you this. It's a scary concept. There has been, uh, over the years... Uh, Trump and, will use it again. I understand. But there's been enormous research over the years expended. Uh, granted, uh, some of this might be a little bit older. That show that my IQ rating uh, with uh, elderly folk uh, is quite high. Uh, in fact, that's my, uh, that's my key demo. And so uh, if they so show pictures of me on Fox News um, and uh, with some notion of, of, of uh, promoting uh, anarcho-communism, I, I am quite confident that um, what will happen is it will maybe, maybe make some of the, um, the, the demo from Fox News you know, be somewhat anarcho-communist uh, curious. I mean, I, I just honestly, like, I understand what you're saying, but I, I do think that the concern is, is, is overblown. But, I am uh, wearing my uh, special shirt today. I don't know if you can see on this camera. Don't uh, show it on the camera. I will, I will not show it on the camera. Can we digitize that? Um, um, I, listen, I, I understand what you're saying, and, but I think there are other things that are probably more pressing to worry about. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good when it comes to having to defend myself in those uh, uh, situations. So, so question, are you yeah. yourself afraid of communism? Or you think other people Absolutely. are afraid of it? Because you, you listen to my show. You listen communism. to the Antifada, right? So what do you like about the Antifada? It's a, it's a communist podcast. Well, I, mm, I, maybe I, I, I haven't heard as many episodes. I'm, I'm for Antifa uh, I, uh, because that's just anti, anti-fascist. And so, uh, you know, but... <laughs> Communism, I mean, it's never worked unless it's like, a, you know, a kibbutz in, in, you know, where it's like 120 people. Communism is a scary thing for, I mean, because you, you, you think of Soviet communism, you think of Chinese communism. I wish we just drop it all. I'm down with socialism. But anyway, I love the show and I don't want to take up all your time. All right, all your well, so, I appreciate the yeah, calm. So I just want to say, like, I am very, very aware of the pitfalls that uh state i mean really they tom, real communism has not been achieved yet um these societies we're talking about were really state capitalists but i i'm very aware of the issues that come along with more authoritarian uh top-down bureaucratic forms of a centrally planned society that's why i am a libertarian socialist or an anti-state communist or you know, I'm still we're, we're all still figuring it out. I don't really like to pin myself down too hard to labels. I'm an anti-authoritarian, basically. And I arrived at this via basically the process of elimination. Right. Because capitalism is, in my opinion, a very bad, uh, inhumane, nonsensical and unstable way of arranging production and society. Um, I believe that everybody deserves a humane life and everyone deserves control over their own life, which can, includes control over their work situation. I mean, we just had an interview with a guy who said people are much happier when they have that sense of control. Um, so I believe that some sort of socialist or communist society is the best way to get that. Now, we've seen it go pretty badly in the past. And I think uh, we need to take these, uh, these, these issues seriously. As we try, see, I don't even want to talk about to transition communism. to I something mean, right. better. If we could well, be but, socialist. Okay, but you you okay. like things like social security, right? Because I want to. Yeah. All right. Well, wait a second. Because I want to put this I, I in mean, historical perspective for I, you a little bit. I listen. I just want to address the, the 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 fear. I don't want to have a debate about communism uh, no, right now. No, but I just want to say, like, perhaps by identifying myself openly as a communist, I'm trying to make it less scary. I'm trying to tell you what we actually believe in and to combat some of the negative, negative propaganda that's been put out there through the years. But just one example, okay? Social security, really important, right? We all favor social security. That was patterned on a mutual aid model. It was partially patterned on a mutual aid model uh, pioneered by anarcho-syndicalist unions to take care of their people after they retired. 
Um, also, like a lot of the New Deal reforms that you're talking about, we got as the result of a strong, strong left movement outside of uh, outside of the mainstream electoral spirit, outside of it, it, it was it was anarchists and it was communists and they went on strikes and the government was really afraid that we were going to have a revolution. And then we won these things as concessions in a larger fight. So even if you don't believe in an anarcho-communist horizon, uh, you need people like us to keep on pushing the envelope and keep on pushing the Overton window. Because if your horizon is social security, you're never going to get there. Uh, well, I, I appreciate you taking my yeah, call. And all right. Appreciate I the respect call. respect your intellect, and you, you guys are very smart, and I learn a lot. Uh, I also know what what people fear, and, you know, you're educated. Well, I mean, frankly, I listen. never could go to college, right? So it's so it's like, you know, uh, yeah, uh, socialism, great. Communism, never. Right. Oh, well, never I'll personally take it. Keep on, you know, uh, right. keep on listening well, to appreciate the, the call. Maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll change your mind. I appreciate the call. And I, and I think like, you know, um, the, I think two things, one, people should not be afraid to hear words, uh, and uh, discuss concepts and, um, let us worry about the idea of people, uh, pulling us out of context and, um, and making hay of it. I have some experience in this context. Uh, believe me. You know, I I made a joke about the idea of uh, of a uh, of of my daughter, um, a, sat a satirical point on on Twitter about my daughter, and about Roman Polanski, and uh, I am here to tell the story. Uh, with that said, and uh, keep in mind the point that uh, Jamie makes, which is uh, more often than not the vast majority of progressive advances that we have made in this country have been as a means of co-opting uh, a movement that is far more radical. And so at the very least, from a completely practical uh, standpoint and a utilitarian standpoint, um, Jamie is very important for us to expand Social Security. Or to, I mean, to, to, uh, uh, to do uh, to get any type of progressive movement. More often than not, the people who will ultimately have to agree to it will be doing so because they're afraid of what will happen if they don't. And so uh, that's basically it. Um, and so there is huge value, and and not even just huge value. There is a total necessity to have people to your left. Uh, as a means of 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 getting any type of advances, um, and so you know, uh, even Jamie to 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 achieve her goals is going to need, uh, you know, like uh, communist dolphins uh, who uh, frighten all of us people who are walking around the on sea uh, comrades, two legs. The sea comrades, yeah. I think uh, Matt has a book he wants to show us. Well, uh, this Hammer and Ho, we've had Robin D.G. Kelly on for this book, actually. This full book is available on libcom.org. It might be good reading if people want to uh, uh, familiarize with this, with some history of communists in America that is less scary than Stalin. Um, calling from a 919 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Oh, hey, Sam. This is uh, Omar Pulse. I'm uh, from Boone, North Carolina. Omar from North Carolina. What's on your mind? Uh, I want to talk to you guys about the conversation you got you had with the uh, the ex-Muslim caller. Yeah. And uh, if I'm mischaracterizing you, but he said that Muhammad was like a bad guy and like violent. And did you say that Muhammad didn't kill innocent civilians in that conversation? Uh, I did not. I don't. I don't know if oh, Muhammad uh, did or did not kill innocent civilians. Um, I can tell you that um, the. The passage that he cited uh, did not call for the killing of innocent civilians. In fact, the passage that he uh, cited, uh, there is um, a, the scholars will give you a completely different read of that uh, passage. Right. Um, I've also, but I've heard you in the past uh, say that like, uh, well, the, when, it, when it was brought up that Muhammad like 
uh, is like a child rapist. You said that um, a lot of people back then in, were involved in their early teens. So I, I, it, I don't know. Maybe I'm mischaracterizing, but it kind of seems like you kind of like eschew aside the fact that like a lot of these like religious prophets are like actually really horrible people. Well, I think look, I haven't met. I haven't met uh, any religious prophets. I I don't um, I don't really know. Um, um, I am not. You know. I am not, I, I think there was a lot of horrible people that we, uh, various societies praise uh, in retrospect, right? I mean, we have uh, our founding fathers, arguably, were also uh, rapists, uh, too. Um, right. Uh, and, um, but I guess my point is, is that um, the stories that people tell about Muhammad uh, or the, uh, the inferences that people make from uh, passages in the Quran um, are, you know, are simply those. Their, their stories and their inferences, and they do not define uh, Islam. Um, and the, the, they certainly do not, uh, I think, you know, uh, I think every religion is problematic um, in the means in which it's practiced. And how religions are practiced is not just a function of what is written in a book that was written, you know, 1,500 years ago, it's also uh, tied to, like, what are the economic circumstances? What are the political circumstances? What, are the, um, um, what is the context of society? And so I think it is a, a foolish endeavor by anybody to, you know, infer. And certainly from that passage, uh, you know, apparently in context, it means a completely different thing than the uh, caller uh, suggested. Well, well I, I, I'm not talking about passages. Can I just say that, like, uh, the little fact I want to give about Muhammad is, like, during... No, 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 he, no, no, uh, see, wait a second. Wait a second. Uh, okay. You're going to give me a fact about Muhammad. Yeah. How do you know this yeah, fact? Yeah, because I, I just... Uh, it's from a, a book. A uh, Hold on. <clears throat> it's from uh, Tariq uh, Ram Ramadan in the Footsteps of the Prophet, Oxford University Press, page 141. Yeah, I mean it's it's. I'm not trying to like smear Muslims, but here here after he uh, after he had his uh, battle with Mecca that a lot of people probably remember. Uh, he oh, won, remember, yeah. and it pissed off a lot of people in the area, and a lot of them were Jews, and they basically mustered a force of like ten thousand men, and um, that force of ten thousand was like repelled by Muhammad, who was uh, defending Medina, and after that, Muhammad was really upset. At, um, certain Jewish tribes in the area because he thought that they were like betraying him, which they mm -hmm. might have. But as a result of that uh, battle aftermath, it, after the battle of the trench, uh, the Jewish tribe, uh, the Banu Karaza, mm -hmm. uh, which were south of Medina, he, he, he uh, killed all the men in that tribe and then enslaved the women. But then the people who converted to Islam, uh, he, he spared. So the point oh, with that is like, I see. he historically was a really bad guy. And then people go around and say that he was like buddies with God and the creator of the universe, like, like sanctions him as like the best person to ever live. And that on its face, the, despite if Muslims today want to ignore it and like, like uh, practice it however they want, that's better than being a fundamentalist. But it's just irrational on the face of it. Hmm. I think you, like, so you're telling me that. Uh, so you're saying that um, uh, other uh, religions are rational as well. Can I use I some mean, facts about the Vatican? No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no, no. I, no, I wait, mean, I, you I, must, you I must mean, be going I, crazy I, off of this stuff about the Catholic Church, right? I am. I am. I'm an atheist, so I, I'm not a hypocrite on that. Right. I know a lot of people are. What about these it, Romans so. who are going around apparently and crucifying people? people were, are you aware of that? Yeah, people. These people Romans. Were, people were pretty bad. In the and then, uh, so when you take someone from the past who's immoral, and then you say... Wait, wait, wait a second, wait a second. I mean, we're these Romans, standards. though. These Romans. What about these rapists who, uh, <laughs> who founded the country? Do you believe that we have Mount yeah, Rushmore? Dude, are you, strapping, the are you strapping dynamite to yourself and going up to Mount Rushmore to get those faces? That, I mean, is that what you're doing? Uh, I mean... That's I mean, come on. Why, Why are you sitting there? Why are you sitting there? Why are you sitting there and paying taxes to a government that would put these people literally on a pedestal? But, but, but don't we but don't we do the same thing with Confederate statues? Like we said, you shouldn't celebrate bad people from the past that are like and try to rationalize it today. 
Like I, I can, I'm kind of open to that argument, Sam. And I, I, I get you're kind of pointing out my hypocrisy there, but like, yeah, that's exactly I mean, what I'm doing. And and I can, comes, and I can, I can tell you, I can, I can tell you, we have a lot more established facts about uh, those uh, Confederate soldiers uh, uh, than white, than you got. I mean, we don't just need page 141. And white me. supremacy is a lot more active than whatever, like I don't know, Islamo fascism or how would you characterize it in America? Like, well, yeah. well, and we crushed yeah, it in America, yeah, but. Well, no, around the world, too. But listen, I appreciate the call. Um, I wish you uh, good luck in all of your endeavors. Um, But, I mean, this is... Who wants to convert, baby? This is really just absurd. Um, You know, you you just can't read it. I mean, you know, if, if you want to call in and say, I think religions are ridiculous because we're worshiping people who... um you know, are we're, we're, we're bad or immoral or this and that. You know what? You may be right. Um, I don't think it's appropriate to have multiple wives, as all of the religious figures do. Um, I also find it hard to believe that people should be going around turning water into wine. I don't think that's healthy. You uh, actually have like a problem with that. Yeah, a yeah. regulatory problem. Excuse me, <laughs> Jesus. Who gave you the right I to think do that? The, the, we don't know the bacteria. Exactly. I was very concerned. Could be very dangerous. And why was he doing that? Why was he doing that? You're in the desert. People need water. Um, I don't like this whole idea of like privatization. I mean, look, you know, it's just like arguing over these things is just silliness. Yeah. It's silly silliness. It was so and cool. We rolled up in there. And he was just like, you got 20 minutes. Convert or it's life. It's one of the most inspiring historical anecdotes I've ever read, white boy. Uh, I Call honestly, again. Look forward to your... T- a, best case scenario, eternal damnation. Or B, my ideal scenario, I get to behead you in a couple years. I honestly think this a lot of the time comes down to idealists versus materialists, where some of these explanations are concerned. Because... If you think that ideals are the primary driver of what goes on in people's lives and in society, you mu- you will blame uh, a religious text for spreading uh, this like set in stone version of the ideals of a certain religion, and that's what's at fault when anyone who subscribes to that religion does something bad. Um, what I believe is it's never it's 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 never that. Almost never that. It's a combination of factors. It's the culture. It's the politics of a given place and time. It's what's going on in a person's life that creates the in, their interpretation of a religion, of an ideal, to perform acts that are good, bad, or both. What do you call, though, the person who uh, doesn't just judge in terms of ideals or materialism, but only drudges ideals with one specific type of person and one specific type of religion. Like this guy could have called up and said like, how is it that you don't dedicate your show to the organized religion that has been um, literally for decades hiding uh, and protecting people who are preying on children, destroying Thousands of lives. Uh, oh, yeah. That was cr- definitely a I mean, like, why does it, Why do we never get those calls from these people who are so worried about religion? Like, how is it that you can sit there and do your show on a daily basis where you are not being critical of, of people? And there are people every single day who pour into these places, these churches, which have been systemically, systemically, as an organization, almost the central premise of the organization is to protect these people yeah i would say the catholic church in just pennsylvania alone is probably more important to focus on if you're an atheist than uh muhammad's biography i gotta tell you what though there's a lot of innovative ideas out there people are talking about declaring caliphates they're talking about bombing new shiite sites but we got to be honest about the price tags I mean, these are ambitious proposals. It's stunning. By the way, some of them are real good ideas that somebody is focused on a uh, a a a supposed child predator from, uh, you know, 2000 years ago, 2000 years ago, went around the corner. I have. 
There was undoubtedly I like come one from that who was the future. By Sad the Harris has given me information yeah. pertaining to crimes. There was three hundred years ago, man. It's just like, look, look, it's, look at it, yourself it in the mirror and so, ask yourself why you're calling in and talking about it's that. It's so simple, and honestly, people who are doing work. Whether they be Muslims, but trying to change political situations, or atheists in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or whatever, like, trust me, your your calls are not helping their efforts. I don't think that's the intention, to be honest with you. I know, but that's always the. I'm cop starting out. to suspect that's, that's always not the cop the out, though. It's like, oh, you guys don't stand in solidarity with uh, rights activists no, in the Middle East and South Asia. Racism probably mixed in when people focus on uh, Islam to the exclusion of. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're looking at look, me I'm like, not gonna lie. When Muhammad duh. went on a tour of the cosmos with an angel, I cried at the revelation. But my favorite parts of that shit was when they beheaded the other tribe. That was <laughs> fucking amazing. And the dude gets to marry whoever the hell he wants. I'll take your daughter. Thank you very much. Boom. But there are people out there who think that all religion is bad and blame it for things that they need a more nuanced analysis of. Right. And you know what? But I, I am I am I am more sympathetic on some level to that level of naivete than I am one that is so selective. So conveniently selective when there are quite substantial targets for uh, that are living in this era, right? Where you can actually bump into on your daily uh, walk to work a victim of that uh, 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 of, of that. Situation. Oh, oh, damn! They're getting the scepter out. Beheading time. <laughs> world star, baby. World star. World star bad. Let's go to the wow, phone. Bar. Colin from, um, yeah, I mean, here's, here is uh, a Catholic priest, uh, you know, abused a thousand children in Pennsylvania report says, and I imagine if you dig down into that story, you will find out the multiple times that that, that priest was protected by the, uh, the, the system. Do I think that means that there is something, you know, um, fundamentally wrong uh with religion i think this is an institution a human institution that was uh corrupt and i think that happens with a lot of institutions hey, look white people are devils wherever they go calling from a 210 area code what an auspicious way to take your phone call who is this and where are you calling from Good afternoon, Sam. It's John from San Antonio. <laughs> John from San Antonio. Impeachment time. Thank you. Thank you for calling and for providing us with this um, palate cleanser. What is happening? Okay, one of the best bank shots of Bernie's 2020 run is that he'll be inspiring progressive uh, potential candidates from down-ballot races, uh, for down-ballot races, and, and they can ride on Bernie's coattail. I've talked to two uh I talked about two uh, close House races uh, last fall. The, they both had Justice Democrats or Our Revolution uh, endorsements. Kara Eastman, uh, who only lost by two points in Nebraska's second district, and Amar Kampanajar, who lost by three points in California's 50th district. Uh, they both decided to run again in 2020, so I support them. The best political uh, moments of 2019 have been the Bernie campaign and the great fresh women like. Uh, AOC, Rashida Tlaib, and uh, El Ilhan Omar. I'm looking forward to supporting more progressive challengers uh, to, in uh, to incumbents in 2020, but I'm a bit taken aback by a story in the National Journal. Yeah. It says, quote, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee is making an early move to deter primary challengers against sitting incumbents in the caucus with a new policy aimed in part at protecting the new majority. The campaign arm on Friday sent out a list of hiring standards to more than 100 political firms, including one provision that made clear that it will neither contract nor recommend to House candidates any political vendors that work to oust sitting members of Congress. The new protocol in, in initially uh, uh, debuted early in the, uh, the in off year uh, before most campaign hiring begins, uh, presents a stark financial deterrent to the, to the country's top firms that provide essential services ranging from polling, 
to TV advertising to strategy. This could cripple would-be primary opponents' ability to entice top talent to join their staff. The DCCC independent expenditure arm doles out millions in contracts to consultants and drives more revenue towards them by contracting campaigns with vetted uh, operatives. The DCCC is oftentimes the gatekeeper for consultants yep. to get to the candidates, Yes, uh, said Ian Russell. So uh, my point is that... Uh, you know, th- there's an extreme generational divide in the Democratic Party between voters you know, under 45 who support progressives and over 45 who largely support centrist and conservatives. Young voters are appalled that their candidates are not given a fair shot at winning. And I agree with you that progressives' best shot at gaining power is through the Democratic Party, but the establishment is pushing them out, and eventually they will become disengaged or join a third party and ensure Republican rule. Uh, Here's a quote from Eric Levin's article in New York Magazine called uh, How the Democrat Establishment uh, Declares War on Democracy. The principal problem with the DCCC policy is that in a political system where interplay, uh, interparty competition is already severely limited, suppressing interparty competition in all House races is an unforgivable infringement on democracy. So, well, I I mean, I first of all, I think it's outrageous. Second of all, I think the the impact of this is not going to be as dramatic as you would think at first. I think this has been an unofficial policy for some time, is my understanding. And um, there are different power dynamics for different players in this space, right? So like a uh, an Act Blue, uh, that's not going to fly with Act Blue. They're going to they're going to continue to do what they're going to do. And nobody's going to walk away from them because they have a different power dynamic. Without a doubt, though, uh, there was a story in The Intercept where a candidate is contemplating dropping out because two vendors um, uh, uh, dropped out from in the from uh, her campaign. I think The Intercept has this story. Uh, Maybe it was up uh, yesterday. So, yeah, this is bad. And um, I think there are still going to be uh, upstart um, uh, vendors, digital vendors in particular, uh, who are going to be servicing these candidates. Um, but, yeah, it's I mean, it's a protection racket. And it I you know, I think that I can understand on some level where your party is going to protect your incumbents, right? That's how you get uh, some, you, you create some type of party discipline. But this is uh, outrageous. And frankly, what it's going to invite is somebody with a lot of money to come in and do what the Koch brothers did to the Republican Party. And that is to basically build an infrastructure um, and fund it. And I don't know if there's somebody out there with money who is inclined to do that in the way that the Koch brothers are uh, for the right, because um, a lot of uh, your primary candidates are going to be, you know, uh, are going to be could be seen as hostile to someone with that kind of money on some level. But um, it's bad. It's it, you know, it, there's uh, the same dynamic as I was talking to before you, you uh, unfairly attempt to quash dissent, um, it, it ends up creating all sorts of different problems. And so I, I don't know if this will, will stand, uh, but, um, you know, I think it's going to be, uh, if it's done properly, it'll be a way in which to create a business model for some people. Like, we only do primary challenges. And um, we have a, a strategy to raise money. Uh, that's actually a really good, you know, because that's the thing that primary challengers can get money now in a way that they couldn't just even five or six years ago. And so the, you know, I don't think it's successful. I think it's very problematic and I think it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be, it's going to leverage more primary challenges actually. So, well, I hope you're right. I hope it does because I mean, you know, people, you know, 2020 it was, you know, really something that I was looking forward to. I mean, you know, and I still am. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. But, I mean, you know, just all the primaries and all of the, the, the progressives that are going to come out. I mean, this movement, there's a reason why, you know, Chris Hayes is having AOC on this Friday. And, you know, no other freshman 
uh, you know, congressperson, you know, are, are are getting the same kind of publicity like uh, Talib, like Ilhan Omar, and you know, you can say that they're being attacked, which is true. But I mean, the passion from the left for these people is extremely strong. Yep. And uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm just, you know, there will come a time where they're going to regret this. You know, yep. they think all they're thinking about is is you know in the moment. But you know, five years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty years down the line, they're going to think. Where did we go wrong? No, and you know that's this is the thing. Well, they're not going to think that. They, the, you're right in terms of what the outcome, but these people would just be in a different job. Then they'll just be protecting their asses in the same way, and they'll probably be successful. I mean, that's this the reality of of the world, but it doesn't matter. The bottom line is, you know, rather than you know, how are these people going to regret this decision? Uh, rather, like you know, how can um, uh, those of us who who, who want to support primaries? How can we leverage it? That's, you know, that's the key. Appreciate the call, John. Right. Okay. No, All right, thank right. you. Thanks. Um, folks, there's some weird stuff going on at Fox News right now. And um, who better to uncover this? Oh, this is the One America Network. The One America uh, Network, of course. Uh, who better to... Um, <laughs> I love this network. Your nation, your news. Own. I think it's O A N. Owned. Owned. And this is an own exclusive. That must have been pretty tough. Uh, they got uh, Bill O'Reilly to talk from his living room. They managed to get him in like once a week at least, it seems like. Yeah, well, it's an exclusive. They have an exclusive <laughs> ability to do that. Um, so. Uh, Bill O'Reilly's brought on own to try and figure out what the heck is going on there. Why, why, why do we have this situation? Maria Bartiromo asked some tough questions of the president. Why, uh, why are we seeing like some measure of dissent from Fox on what's going on? Bill, you haven't been there in two years. Can you tell us? In your mind, what, what's going on at Fox right now? Are they, are they shifting? Well, they left? have a boycott situation. Uh, you know, I don't think there's an organized cabal in Fox News and management that says, well, let's go left. Um, I'm not there. I've been there for two years. But what I do know is that the boycotts from the far left, Media Matters, um, Move On, all of these uh, horrible organizations <laughs> that are in business to hurt people with whom they disagree, have been effective in boycotting the Pause Fox it. Can News I just, uh, you know, just, just, I just want to plant a flag here. Bill O'Reilly used to send out his reporters to harass people who had no idea what was going on. Bill O'Reilly um, demonized a, an abortion provider until the day he was shot dead. Just to remind you of, of this. Um, Bill O'Reilly used that platform to hurt person after person after person his entire show was modeled on some type of sadistic um you know cosplay that actually wasn't cosplay it's horribly sadistic if anybody was in any way responsible for creating this type of dynamic bill o'reilly is probably up in the pantheon that are in business to hurt people with whom they disagree have been effective in boycotting the fox news channel and they've lost a lot of money. Right. So what I believe is happening, and I, again, I don't have access to people, Patrick, but I, I know the organization, I worked there more than 20 years, is that in order to make the sponsors more comfortable, that Fox is trying to get out any kind of real strong, hard rate, hard right um, presentation. They, they want to de-emphasize the hard right presentation to make the sponsors feel that, oh, we're not in any place where we can get boycotted. It's all about the boycott. It's all about the boycott. Now, I, I have a theory that um, now that they have uh, sold off a lot of the assets of Fox to uh, Disney, um, made something like, I don't know, eight, nine billion dollars. Selling off of all a lot of Fox assets, not Fox News. Um, 
I think it's conceivable they want to get out of that business a little bit of the Fox News business. And uh, one of the ways you do that is you, 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 you no one's going to buy it. I mean, no one unless you find another lunatic who wants to be associated with that. Uh, despite the fact that it's pretty cash, uh, it's 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 quite a cash cow. Now that the the money is getting a little bit dried up, they need to move uh, and change their stripes a little bit if they want to sell or or continue to make that kind of cash. Um, that's basically what's going on there. But um, how long is Tucker contract uh, Tucker Carlson's contract for? I have no idea. Because I feel like if that if they really want to do that pivot, he's got to go. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I think you know, obviously, like a Laura Ingram would have to go and whatnot, but they can if also. If anybody is pivotal, I'll tell you something. It would be him, though. Yeah, but that's the thing is that yeah. they these yeah. they they are all capable. They can all make their shifts. Of saying something different if the cash is there. Um, there's no doubt in my mind. They're all capable of doing that, and that's you know, look, look at look at the pirouettes that Glenn Beck has done. I mean, literally. Don't don't you mean uh, his don't insult ideological Tucker. journey. His his ideological journey. His uh, his. I mean, I just the idea. We did this uh, this this video. I guess uh, last week or something. The idea that two years ago, almost to the day, there's a half a dozen uh, pieces. You know. Thoughtful pieces in the New Yorker magazine or New York magazine in the New York Times. I never did what Beck did. I don't get any credit. We need to come together to defeat Donald Trump. And then two years later, he's on uh, uh, Hannity's show saying we need to come together to reelect Trump. I mean, the similarity between Samantha B and Glenn Beck is, Sam. What's that? Devils. Devils. What? Speaking of devils, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there are reports that. Donald Trump was mad that the economy is not uh, hitting the growth marks that it was uh, they had projected following the tax cuts. And apparently his chief economic advisor, um, who has been really, really beset with a lot of um, uh, health issues, apparently, uh, Lawrence Kudlow, um, rolled out of bed saw Stephen Moore on television saying that, well, the reason why there's not growth is because uh, the Fed is not dropping rates. Went to Donald Trump and said, you should think about Stephen Moore. That's my best impression of, uh, and apparently Donald Trump is thinking about Stephen Moore, um, who has been a longtime TV economist. There you go. And semi-pundit. That's the best kind. Who is, um, and you can, uh, really, I think you could probably turn on any uh, cable news outlet to see an example of him being completely wrong. And not just completely wrong in, in projection and conjecture, but like just making up facts, just telling lies and getting called out on it. Um, and yet he continues to uh, return and... Uh, gets fired from one place, gets hired again, and then he ends up at the Heritage Foundation, which is sort of basically a, um, a genuine welfare um, uh, job. And uh, here he is. Let's just add to that, uh, that um, the, the pantheon of things that Stephen Moore got horribly wrong. He was brought in as one of the consultants for the Kansas Miracle, the one true experiment of the Laffer curve. In fact, they even brought in Arthur Laffer. Sam Brown back did. Here's an interview that he's giving back in um, 2014 on the Kevin Price show, talking in 2014 about the Kansas miracle that is about to be unleashed. They have just cut taxes. In fact, the tax cut was very similar uh, to some of the uh, things, particularly when it came to um, S corps um, that uh, that was passed on a federal level. Um, but in Kansas, of course, you can't deficit spend. So their whole idea is we're going to cut taxes so much that economic activity is going to explode. And so we're going to cut taxes, but on a volume level, we're going to make more in tax revenue. That's what growth does. And so here he is on, uh, this is uh, clip number six. Um, where he talks about Brownback. This is all from the same uh, 
Same. Uh, wait, which one's the first one in the uh, Brendan is six. The earlier of the two. Okay, so this is uh, number six. And Brownback is, you know, you don't want to make Kansas look like New York. You want to make Kansas look like, uh, uh, you want to make Kansas look like Texas. And so Sam Brownback cut tax rates. Uh, they've got some growth going on there. Uh, but the left, he is under complete assault from the left, and they're creating this fairy tale that it's ruining the state, you know, and we've cut taxes, quote, for rich people, and, you know, we're defunding the schools. There is no truth to any of that, but... Uh, you know, what's really interesting about this is that uh, the unions are just pouring money into this race because there's a, a big election, as you know, in, in 10 days. But Sam Brownback has been one of the top governors. I think he's going to win. He's going to defeat these left-wing interest groups that are trying to run him out of town. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Of course, uh, yeah, it is interesting. Our, our All right, pause it. Let's take a look at uh, that assessment. This is in 2014. Um, it is true. Brownback went on to win by 3.69 percent within um, 12 months then on to 24 months of that um, election his approval rating was 23 percent why was that the case because after passing those tax cuts moody's downgraded the state bond rating in 2014 the S&P downgraded its credit rating from AA plus to AA in August 2014 due to budget uh, that analysts described as structurally unbalanced again in 2017 from AA to AA minus. By 2018, overall growth and job creation in Kansas had underperformed the national economy, neighboring states, and even Kansas's own previous growth years. Kansas jobs growth lagged behind uh, neighboring Missouri, Colorado, and Nebraska. The um, by early 2017, Kansas has had nine rounds of budget cuts over four years, three credit downgrades, missed state payments, basically a rolling fiscal crisis that started 30 seconds after more was done talking on that radio program. So not enough tax cuts to make up. On the budget shortfall, despite the fact that all the tax cuts were going to create growth and increase the revenue that came in, lawmakers had to tap into state reserves that were set aside for future spending. Construction projects were postponed. Pension contrib contributions and Medicaid were cut. And since approximately half the state's budget went to school funding, education was particularly hard hit. The, the uh, state university, which used to be the pride of Kansas, Severe cuts. Kansas is still roiling, so much so that in 2018, lawmakers reversed those tax cuts. They gave up on the whole thing. And Sam Brownback, knowing that he couldn't rerun for election, knowing that his political future in Kansas was over, got a job with the Trump administration as the ambassador, are you ready to this, of faith or to Faith, to literally faith. an ambassadorship position somewhere hovering over the planet, I guess. He's securing thoughts and prayers. Securing thoughts and prayers, <laughs> floating in a bubble, hovering ab amongst us as like, a, a, like an ethereal object. But let's hear more of Stephen Moore talk about the great Kansas miracle that was happening. His entire economic paradigm falling apart as he's speaking on there all those lies that he was talking about lies go ahead of course uh, our our friend governor walker in wisconsin is fighting for his political Wait, is life this the next yeah. number seven yeah let's go to number seven. Oh yeah Stephen moore also said that uh, scott walker this foxconn deal is really going to help him uh with re-election incidentally oh no in the uh, presidential election that's where he thought yeah, i should remind you scott walker first guy to drop out in the uh, 2016 election uh-huh here what you know what are you seeing in the numbers that should make people excited about what's happening in kansas yeah as well they, they are starting to create jobs again in kansas you know and that's a big deal you know they're starting to see jobs come so. back and they're uh starting to uh economize on their services mm. um they're trying to Posit. Think, you know economize on their services 
Do you know, that sounds very good. You know what that is? Like they're Danny. having to cut their budget because the revenue is not coming in. Go ahead. Um, they're trying to make, you know, uh, allow taxpayers to get a bang for their buck. You know, now the unions hate that. Pause Kevin it. Is- Do you know what bang for their buck means? We've cut the prices of services so that they're more cost effective. Yeah. I want to give you no bucks for no bang. Right, really. exactly. You know, now the unions hate that, Kevin, mm. as you know. They hate unions that idea. That. They want government to be as wasteful and bloated as possible, uh, you know, so that more money goes into their coffers and, and funds the big labor bosses. That's what this fight is all about. Yeah. I'm looking at some of the yeah. numbers, and they're pretty startling, actually. And, you know, and they look small, but on the other hand, you've got to look at it contextually. You know, for example, Illinois is four times larger than, uh, than Kansas, yet, it, it, you know, meanwhile, Kansas has created more private sector jobs in the entire state of Illinois. That, a, that to me, is a startling amazing. statistic. Yeah, because you know, Illinois raised their income taxes. You know, I'm from Illinois, I think, as you know, Kevin, and uh, you know, I'm from the Chicago area, and Illinois does all the wrong things. When I was growing up there, the income tax rate was 3%. Then uh, Governor Quinn raised it to 5%, and now they're going to raise it up to the unions want to raise it to 7 or 8%. It's <laughs> unbelievable. There's never enough money for these unions. Never enough money. Never so, enough money. I- never enough money. Uh, these numbers are startling, and uh, it's very important when you're talking about the Kansas miracle to talk about a different state and to talk about unions who are not involved in any of that. Uh, Where so does he think unions get their money? They get it from some type of secret well, and then they, they spend it, it from, and they funnel it to the uh, it big from fat the government. They want more and more and more. That's all they do. Really? Take, uh, and if you had bigger tax cuts, then you would have bigger jobs. And that dude may be um, sitting on the Fed. Stephen Moore, great guy, smart like they guy. They literally get their money from <laughs> the dues people pay from the real money that they make guy. working. Um, he does it on TV, so it's real. So Bernie, is this uh is this is California? He had a big rally. He in had a couple. He had San Francisco. It was L.A. and San Francisco swing. Um, and here is uh, Bernie on that. Um, California is going to be a very very important state for Bernie uh, because Kamala Harris is, um, and I think you know, haven't heard too much of it, and I think we're going to get back to hearing more about this as we get uh, as we move closer to the debates. But um, there's going to be a big expectation game in terms of uh, Kamala Harris. If she cannot win decisively in California, she's going to have a problem, right? Because this is her home state. This is where she launched her campaign. She had 20,000 people out there. That's uh, what created quite a stir. If uh, Bernie keeps it close or even could win uh, California, uh, it's going to go a it's going to be that's going to be a a, a signal to the rest of the field that uh, they have a problem. I'm here rallying the people. She's rallying APAC. Well, we will get to Let's that in just Boom. a moment. But here That's is actually not a bad line for here him. is uh, here is uh, Bernie Sanders um, calling for this uh, hoax report to be released. Before I begin my remarks, I want to mention to you what I think what most of you already know is that the uh, Bob Mueller investigation was submitted to the Attorney General. Now, I haven't read the report yet. It hasn't been made public. I think I have something in my uh, email uh, box right now. We're reading it after this. But what I know is that it is a summary of the report. Well, I don't want a summary of the report. I want the whole report. Because nobody, especially this president, is above the law. There you go. Um, it's the first well, time I think Bernie's been bleeped on this show. Well, that I bleep know. really made it sound like a worse swear than we, it actually was. Was it just damn report? I, I thought so. I want to read yeah. the motherfucker. <laughs> Total everything. I think he should. I think he should even use uh, certain adjectives. I think he should just bleep himself because it sounds good. Every good report, <laughs> every single fucking I and T. That was, but that's perfect. Yep. I don't. To me, that that circles the square of this whole little argument about it. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm a critic of a lot of aspects of this that we kind of went over yesterday, but are you kidding me? That's our report. Of course, you need to release them. And not it. only that, you also need to immediately go on the counteroffense because whatever else this story played out, Trump is using this in an attempt to consolidate his authoritarianism. So the only issue right now for people is release the thing. That's our report, buddy. 
That's our report, like the literary kid says. I want to, um, we're going to, we have a couple more clips of uh, APAC. We have Mike Pompeo there. But I first off want to start by congratulating Kamala Harris on two things. One, I want to congratulate her. She came out with a, uh, I think, a pretty decent proposal that hopefully will get uh, more, um, will get this issue um, uh, more in the, uh, the popular discourse, which is a proposal to close the pay gap for teachers. Um, calling for uh, the estate tax to be raised and the federal government providing t uh, first 10 percent in a raise for teachers across the board and then um, a matching funds with states. Um, I, I applaud that. She's going after the, uh, the, the teachers union's uh, endorsement and good. I hope there's a huge raise for that so that we support um, uh, public education even more than we do now, which in depending on where you live, because uh, we know that that uh, education in this country is funded in a completely uh, self-defeating way. The biggest challenge to education is what happens in the home. And if you send and, and kids coming from uh, a household that is uh, living in poverty or near poverty, underperform in school and schools cannot fix that so you need to uh, provide a funding and it, well i should say schools can only fix that so much you need to provide a uh address the underlying problems and then b you need to provide earlier schooling more competent schooling and more funded schools but in those areas which need it the most because of the way that we fund schools with property taxes, they get the least. So kudos to her for talking about uh, federal support for our schools. And also kudos to Kamala Harris for saying to APAC, I am joining uh, some like fellow four or five candidates in uh, boycotting the APAC uh, conference. I'm not going to go there and give a speech because of their uh, attacks on folks like Ilan Omar and the fact that they are pushing a, an agenda, uh, the right-wing agenda in its uh, support of Israel. So kudos for her. And then, uh, and here she is taking a celebratory picture of that, um, that boycott with the uh, entire executive suite of APAC in her office. Is that what's going on there? Yes. Huh. That's California. <laughs> oh, the California delegation. I think it's, uh, well, can I just say, though, it is important to note that all of the other candidates who have not attended did not explain why. They just aren't going. Bernie's the only campaign that released a statement specifically saying APAC's uh, comments on Ilan Omar and so on is why he's not going. That is a meaningful distinction. Yes. But this is yes. this is a lot of brass right here. <laughs> this takes the cake. <laughs> that look on her face is like I didn't realize there'd be a photo. That look on her face is like I'm good at this. I'm gonna break this down to Charlemagne the God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll help her. Yeah. There is a charm in how totally full of it she is. Just like Do we have a uh, clip eleven? Do this, this bad boy. Uh, let's go to the phones. Call him from a 920 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? This is Sala from Milwaukee. Sala from Milwaukee. Welcome to the program. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was going to call last week, but I was a little scared because Jamie mentioned anarcho communism. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Right. I understand. Well, I'm glad um, you got your courage up. <laughs> um, uh, a while ago, Ronald Reagan called in, it was like a couple months ago, and yes. you talked about ICE. And um, you guys said something about uh, um, scrutiny, like you have to have scrutiny with like people from the bottom all the way to the top of it, right? Yeah. yeah. So... I was wondering if you see that, like, if you look at the military that same way. I don't know. I'm not like, sure I know what you're what you mean. 
like like you're saying like the, the border patrol people and like um like they're like just as bad as the people at the top kind of I don't know There, I mean, I look, I think, playing. yeah, I know what you're saying, but I think um, Ronald, in Ronald Reagan's experience, there's a lot of latitude that um, okay. the the um, uh, the lawyers that he's come in contact with who work for, um, and I don't want to speak for him, but uh, I think there's a lot of latitude and a lot of discretion that is offered uh, these um, uh, the the immigration lawyers. The or not immigration, but the uh, CBB uh, lawyers and ICE agents, um, and okay. he has experienced that uh, discretion, um, and I think I think that's what he's talking about. I don't think in the same context with the military. Now, I would imagine in a in, you know in, in a wartime situation, uh, a good military does not allow for its uh, soldiers to have uh, discretion. It is this is the uh, rules of engagement. Mm-hmm. You follow them. Um, but uh, so I don't think this is a I don't think uh, what Ronald Reagan is talking about is a, a philosophical or even, you know, or is, there, is any type of framework. I think it's just talking about from his personal experience. Okay. They seem to have uh, a lot of discretion and uh, to the extent that they are being allowed to use it. I mean, look, the only the only sort of analogy um that I think you could find in terms of the military, at least, or the one that comes to mind, Mm -hmm. is the way that we ended up getting torture was the civilian leadership basically didn't say, you you know, go torture. It basically said, we're taking the shackles off of you. We want this Mm -hmm. and that. It's up to you how you get it. And that's that's when we ended up getting uh, torture. And I'm quite convinced they knew what they were doing, but that's the way they do it. Um, and I think to mm-hmm. a certain extent, uh, you, the, in fact, I think I've read stories where you see ICE agents or, you know, uh, commentary on what's going on within ICE. And it's like the shackles are off. And uh, so there's a similar dynamic. And, you know, and I think that's about as far as it would go. But, uh, you know, I think uh, Ronald Reagan was talking from his, his experience as an uh, immigration attorney. Appreciate the call. Okay. Thank you for answering. Thanks. Calling from a uh, 914 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Yes! What? Yes! Yes! I feel like I might regret this. Jermo here. Jermo! Wow. Jermo here. Jermo, where oh, have you right. been? Where am I been? I've been working. I've been uh, doing a lot of interesting things. What have you been doing right well, now? It sounds like you've been running around your house. You, you, you know when you work and you do carpentry and your glasses keep falling off? Yes, I do. And you want to, you, you, you ready? Off. Are you ready, Jermo, for me to change? I'm not a show off, Michael. Wait a second. Jermo, <laughs> calm down. Are you yes. ready for me to change your life? Because I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> you, you, you're they, doing carpentry. They, 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 like, your glasses good, fall man. off because you're moving. You ready for me to change your life? You ready? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Are you watching? Yeah. Are you watching the show? No, I'm, no, I'm on the phone. I just my iPhone. All right. Well, and then I'm not going to show you, but on my glasses, I have little rubber tabs that live basically on the uh, bridge of the glasses, on the two bridges that uh, and they're behind my ear. And it has been a revelation to me. It is made. No, that is not it. <laughs> that is not it. They're like fins, right? Yep. They're like little fins. I'm not going to show them because then everybody's just going to be Are focused they- on that and I'm going to be mocked. <laughs> Because I am mocked. When where, I take where can them, I get these? You can get, get them. These? You can get them. Uh, you know, uh, go online. I was subject search. to various forms of mockery. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, I want you to search. Um, right. Now let me tell you the reason I'm calling. What's that? Let me tell you the reason. Okay, call. Let me tell you the reason I'm calling. Yes. I got about 50 square feet of brand new oak flooring in. <laughs> All right. All right. And it's it's beautiful. This guy got this carpenter. He's unbelievable. Great. Anyway, do you know that they don't sell the natural stain anymore? I did not know that. I don't yeah. know who they are, but so I'm trying to. Well, I use I I won't say the brand name, but it, it's really a good one. And I, I can't even. I'm going to need at least. I'm probably going to need a gallon and a half. 
and I can't get it. So I was going to ask you, what do you do with your hardwood floors, with your oak hardwood floors? I don't stain them. You don't stain them? No. Nope. So you just put no. the polyurethane down? That's correct. And, uh, Jeremo, uh, as a bonus, I'm going to give you this. They are called Cal Level Eyeglass Ear Grip Silicone Ear Hooks. No! Yep. yep. No, I need, I need an answer on the heart on the oak floor, I man. gave you one. Bye, Jeremo. Thank you for calling. I gave you two answers. Son of a gun. Now I'm just, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do with this floor. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my wow. God. That was nuts. But I'm telling you, the, the Mohammed get those, guy gets 30 minutes. But your old gl- buddy, well, I answered. Just shipped uh, not right only did off, I answer huh? his question, I um, unbelievable. I answered his question and I gave him a bonus on the glasses thing. That's going to change his life. Believe me, ear grip, silicone, ear hook. Just Google that. Um, here is uh, Mike Pompeo at APAC talking about uh, America being infested, infested. Media. It's supported by certain members of. This bigotry is taking on an insidious new form in the guise of anti Zionism. It's infested college campuses in the form of the boycott, defest, and sanction movement. It's discussed in our media. It's supported by certain members of Congress, I suspect none of whom are here tonight. <laughs> now, now, don't get me wrong. Criticizing Israel's policies is an acceptable thing to do in a democracy, it's, it's what we do. Oh, thank you. But criticizing the very right to exist of Israel is not acceptable. No one has criticized the right for Israel to exist. Um, No one has questioned the dual loyalty. None of that has happened. But whether it's Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer or Mike Pompeo, that is the narrative they want you to believe. It's just not the case. Here's Mike Pompeo uh, celebrating the fact that the United States and to a large extent, the uh, opportunity for America to be a um, an honest broker uh, in this conflict there has has long since passed. Uh, But here is Mike Pompeo celebrating the fact that Donald Trump has probably made one of the few. The few sort of like status quo situations in that region that has not been a hot button topic for decades he has managed to make it a hot button topic we're gonna bring that back we're gonna bring that back wait golan heights is the only place where things are not a a shit show wait a second we're gonna fix that and of course it was uh, a great honor to be on israeli soil uh and to celebrate with Prime Minister Netanyahu at the very moment President Trump boldly recognized the Golan Heights for what it is, a part of Israel. As most of you would have seen by now, just a short while ago, President Trump, alongside Prime Minister Netanyahu, signed a decree, a decree affirming Israel's sovereignty over the Golan. What a truly great two days for two great nations. Oh, Jesus. Um, and the implications of allowing land that was captured in a military conflict to be annexed in this way, obviously uh, highly problematic um, for uh, going forward. Well, I mean, it's also, it's just, you know, (laughs) but this is what they've been doing in general is basically just formalizing what has already existed because of raw power. And this is specifically, and I don't think the alternatives to Netanyahu, frankly, are any better from the perspective of like actual humanitarian situation in Palestine. I mean, his main rival is a general who was involved in atrocities in Gaza. But this is specifically time to help Netanyahu's reelection, who's facing an incredibly serious corruption probe. And not just like a, you take some money to do this, like something that actually implicates 
what is left of internal democracy in 67 Israel. Did you um, seek uh, throw mama from the train? Or the <laughs> That's uh, a classic, of yeah. course. Crisscross. Yeah. Crisscross. I saw it and throw mama from the train. It's, it's a hitchhiker from a train. Crisscross. I help him. I he help you me. get elected so you don't go to jail. You help me get reelected so I don't go to jail. I mean, basically. Yeah. I mean, that's also, basically. I think that's a very reflective of their relationship. Crisscross. Once again, very nice pivot from Israel's right to exist to Israel has sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Right. Like exactly. those are the same thing. No, and but if those you people don't mean think that. That's what they mean. They mean Israel has a right to exist as a perpetually expanding apartheid state. And also, you know, and it's funny because, I, I, look, I'm sorry, both ideologically and Israel? logistically. What did you say? Why do you hate Israel? So much. Well, because I've been Jews? there, they're very annoying. Why do you hate Jews? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're Mashuga. But, um, but I support, you know, I think logistically and ethically a full democracy for everybody. But what's it? it it's just... Ilan Omar was in the Washington Post a couple weeks ago, and she said specifically that she supports a two-state solution. So it's like on top of every other lie and instigation against her, we're just going to take as like a matter of principle that what her stated policy is in her policy. Okay, guys. What a bunch of fucking scumbags. Man, yeah, even I think Israel has a right to exist insofar as any state does. Boo. <laughs> Zion Jamie. Zion <laughs> Jamie. Jamie. It's tough stuff. Should we talk? Hear a lot about food, not bombs. Hear a lot about capitalism, this and that. But all of a sudden, when it comes to the tribe, an ethno state can exist. Sad stuff <laughs> and tough stuff. Zion the, Jamie. Is this, this is clip number 11, right? So uh, the Republican Party is trying to figure out what they're going to run on in 2020. And uh, they think they've found it. And that is, of course, um, to appeal to all those people who are out there who had to go underneath their desks, hide underneath their desks as school children in the 1950s uh, because of the Cold War. And uh, they're bringing that back. I just don't think um, it's like, you know, thin ties. It's not something that's going to come back into fashion. It's not going to take off like bell bottoms. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> Let's... <laughs> Let's play this clip. This is uh, Roger Williams, Republican from Texas. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here today. And uh, I want to I start off every hearing with a simple yes or no answer from the from all of you, and I'll start with you, Ms. Lamb. Now, pause it. Um, now, who is he uh, interviewing? Is he, uh, who are these uh, folks in this? This is the Finance Committee. Um, yeah, just some uh, random uh, uh, industry leaders. But let's let's find out what uh, what his first question. I like to do this uh, first question for everybody. Here we go. Let's see if we can do this. Make this as remedial as possible. I want to. I start off every hearing with a simple yes or no answer from the from all of you, and I'll start with you, Miss Lamb. Um, yes or no? Are you a socialist or capitalist? <laughs> Pause it. Now I want to point out something to the good <laughs> congressman from. From Texas. Standard yes or no questions will invite a yes or no answer. That is the nature of a yes or no question. So if I ask you, are you a capitalist or a socialist, yes or no, it becomes virtually impossible for you to answer this question in an appropriate manner. The, the standard, and I understand maybe they do things different in Texas because we're bigger. So our yes or no questions actually involve having to provide another word in addition to yes or no. You remember when, well, Alex, Joe, ask, you remember when are, Alex Jones said that kid who would leave his parents' house on his show and he's just like, thanks for coming on down to Texas. <laughs> Took a lot of courage. This is the uh, this is preparing for the storm, reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program. Yeah, the National Flood Insurance Program. <laughs> it which sounds like a very apropos time to which, have a nonsense which conversation is about Which super nothing. ironic. Because the answer this guy wants is, are you a capitalist? While we are here talking about subsidizing rich people's homes, broadly speaking, who buy houses on the coast that otherwise would not have any value but for the federally subsidized flood insurance. But let's hear the, the answers to this yes or no question that is also has a subsidiary question, which is, are you a capitalist or a socialist? Thank you all for being here today. And uh, I want to... 
I start off every hearing with a simple yes or no answer from the from all of you, and I'll start with Not you, Ms. So Lamb. Uh, yes or no? Are you a socialist or capitalist? <laughs> I defer to the next one in line. Thank to you, the what? Ms. <laughs> Lamb. Thank you very much. You don't have to answer that. Are you a socialist? <laughs> Am I a socialist or a capitalist? Capitalist. I thought it was yes or no. A yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> capitalist, sir. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> socialist or capitalist? Capitalist. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I thought this is a yes or no question, correct? Yes. Are you a socialist <laughs> or are you a capitalist? I, I'm just following direction, yes okay. or no, so yes. <laughs> Yes, sir. Next. Yes, sir. I'm a capitalist. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> the, the guy doesn't, still doesn't get it. Well, still does not get it. This is just a yes or no answer. Each one of those people is either a socialist or a capitalist. That's right. That's what that means. There you go. Oh, boy. I have a feeling that that, that may play in Texas in his specific... Yeah. Uh, He's in there. See, you Yankees think that I, I embarrassed there, myself. But and I fact, asked them, are ahead. you a capitalist or a socialist? Yes or no? They said yes. <laughs> I do I like that, actually, though. He's just like, you, you Yankees think I messed up with that. This cool campaign yeah, he, right there for me. Yeah, exactly. Like five, <laughs> at five different points in that clip, you could have been like, okay, I'll clarify. Just say capitalist or socialist. Just so say I'm not trying yes to no clarify. Thing. I'm trying to get the goddamn I'm e just. Well, I want to clarify. Ready. Are you a heads or tail, or socialist, or capitalist? Just answer uh, yes or no. <laughs> Heads or tails? Socialist or capitalist? Blink twice, you're capitalist. Unbelievable. Oh, hold the days right. if you're socialist. Oh, I didn't even turn on the IMs. Uh, all right, let's take one more phone call. I'm just picking randomly. Uh, let's do it this way. I hope it's the Tulsi Gabbard guy. Um, Michael, give me a number, uh, one to Two. ten. Two? Jamie, give me a number, one to ten. Six. Six. All right. It is the 26th call that we will take on the list, and that is, oh, wait, shoot, I, I clicked it. Okay. You're calling from an 856 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, 856. 856. Oh, hi. I'm calling from New Jersey. Okay. And what's your name? Uh, David. David from New Jersey. What is on your mind, David? Yes. Uh, well, I, you are the I final call of the, most... of the day. Okay. Uh, when uh, Donald Trump recognized or delegitimized Venezuela in his own mind, right? And uh, and uh, some others, <laughs> of course. Uh, that was the most uh, uh, si significant action that he's taken so far. And uh, and then with the uh, recognizing of the uh, Golan Heights, uh, he has uh, basically, um, I think, uh, put us in the position of uh, whether we choose to be a part of the international community or we don't, whether we support the United Nations or we don't. Right. Uh, let's come out and just say it, because what he did was, and what they have done is to uh, destroy the United Nations. I, I mean, look, I think the uh, the legacy of the of the Trump administration in terms of foreign policy is that uh, we are not a uh, a reliable partner, whether it's uh, you know not just in the moment, but. If you were uh, from, if you were a, a a different country looking upon this country, your only your only assessment of this country that I think would be in, in any way accurate is that this is a destabilized country. That um, the fact that we could go from Obama to Trump suggests that it doesn't matter who we have as president for the next eight years. That is going to be no indication as to what the trajectory of this country is in terms of its foreign policy. Uh, or, or any other policies for that matter. And so um, I think, you know, that is perhaps one of the sort of the longest legacies aside, probably from the judicial uh, branch that uh, Trump will ha will leave, which is that we are not a reliable partner, one that is a, a predictable entity on the world stage, and that is going to have uh, reverberations for years to come. I appreciate the phone call. Folks, 
we are out of time. I apologize, callers. Could not get past, uh, you know, eight of you today. Maybe we got to come up with another system or something. I don't know what, but. Call clock. Call clock. Oh, yeah, that could be it. All right, folks. See you tomorrow. It might take a street black guy to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. But finding out won't make me feel any better. Yeah, I know. Thanks.